Um, I think we'll just go straight into the agenda now. And apologies, I've received an apology. Um, actually, just before I do that, let's make sure we've got everybody on the call. That might be a good idea. Um, so can I um, do the principal thing of uh, uh, going through the roll call? Um, Bill Cashmore? Present. Thank you. Uh, Josephine Bartley? Present. Kathy Casey? Here, yeah, Phil. Thank you, and my condolences too for, for Case's mum, uh, just to put that on record, um, really feel for you in that situation and for Case. Um, Fesso Collins. Uh, kia ora, Mayor and Councillors. Uh, kia ora, uh, Pippa Coombe. Come on, Pippa, I know you're there. <laughs> <laughs> Kia ora, Mr Mayor. Definitely here. Hello, <laughs> Thank you. Um, Linda Cooper. Here, uh, yeah, Angela yeah. Dalton. Chris Darby. I'm not hearing, and that might mean that you're not putting your mic on. Um, are you there, Chris? Apparently you are, but I can't hear you. So we'll just check the sound is okay. Can I come back to you, Chris, and we'll, we'll double check that we can hear you. Okay. Oh, okay. No, I heard you, heard you then. That's that's great. Uh, Alf Filipina. Alf, have we got you on the line? Is that your worship? Thank you. Yeah, it, there seems to be a bit of a delay today. I don't know whether that's um, going to happen right the way through. Uh, Chris Fletcher. Present. Thank you. Shane Henderson. Yeah, Mr. Thank you. Richard Hills. Morning. Tracy Mulholland. Morena. Daniel Newman. Good morning, Your Worship. Greg Sayers. It's good. Good morning. Thank you. Desley Simpson. Good morning, present. Thank you. Sharon Stewart. Good morning. Thanks, Sharon. Uh, uh, David Taipuri. Kia ora, Your Worship. Kia ora, David. Uh, Wayne Walker. Good Wayne, morning. Wayne. Yep, got you. Got you. Uh, uh, John, John Watson. Watson. Hello, everyone. And Glenn Wilcox. Kia ora. And Paul Young. Good morning, Mr Mayor. Good. I think we've got a, uh, a full house, so that's great. Um, we'll resume. Uh, the agenda was, uh, first of all, apologies, and I've got apologies from David Taipuri for early departure at 2 p.m. Um, let's see if we can uh, finish before Paul, uh, before uh, David has to get away. Um, so uh, I'll move that we accept that apology. Have I got a seconder for that, please? Second. Thank you. Um, all those in favour, please say aye. To the contrary, no. Carried. Um, any declaration of interest that uh, any member or councillor needs to make today? Good, thank you. Uh, confirmation of minutes. We've got one set of minutes, the 23rd of April, 2020. Um, I'll move that we accept that. Do I have a seconder, please? Yeah, I'll second that, Phil. Uh, Deputy Mayor Cashmore, all those in favour, please say aye. To the contrary, no carried. Um, no petitions, no public input, no local board input. No extraordinary items uh, indicated. So we come now to the first substantive item uh, on COVID-19. And I welcome online. I'll just check I've got in here. Uh, Kate, have we got you? Kate Crawford on the line. Uh, Mace oh. Boards representing okay. the group controller today, Your Worship. Thanks, Mace. So we've got Ian and Mace. And um, we're starting with... Ian, I think. All right. Look, thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. Um, look, we've got actually three talkers today. So uh, Mace, who's the uh, group controller uh, this week, uh, he'll commence talking through the, where we are with respect to the response uh, activity. We've also got Phil Wilson with us uh, today, and Phil has picked up another role, um, as I'm sure you uh, noticed last week, uh, in terms of recovery manager. So we've got an opportunity to talk through uh, recovery. It look, the whole area of recovery is just starting to come together, and again, it's a, it's a nationally um, orientated framework within which Auckland will be working, and we're just starting to sort of pull that together. And then I'll come back 
back and talk through where we are as Auckland Council as we look um, as we've deployed into level three and as we look towards um, what we're doing in level two. So look, I'll I'll ask Mace just to to run through where things are at with res with respect to the response phase. So Mace. Uh, kia ora everyone. Um, just to um, just run through um, initially a bit of an introduction. So the nationwide uh, state of emergency has been extended until next Wednesday, the 6th of May. Uh, and as you and uh, you mentioned, Your Worship, uh, New Zealand has moved to alert level three or restrict, and we um, expect to stay in that alert level for the next two weeks until Cabinet further reviews um, where, where we should where we are tracking on the 11th of May. Um, Kate uh, Crawford and myself continue to work uh, side by side as, as group controllers and deputy group controller. And we've established, uh, which Phil will talk about, an operational leadership group uh, to coordinate the resumption of Auckland Council activities and the recovery function under the, um, the CDM approach or emergency management group. Uh, and that includes uh, myself, Kate Crawford, uh, Phil Wilson, uh, the Group Welfare Manager, Greg Morgan, and the uh, Auckland Council's Crisis Management Team Lead, uh, in Maxwell. Uh, we will also be engaging with external agencies uh, in, in that recovery process. Um, the Emergency Coordination Centre update, just a status update. Uh, we're based in Bledisloe House and have a um, an active team of people here on level one and level nine, um, and, and working together with um, representatives from the other agencies uh, in, in those locations. A number, of, the number of essential staff is, has increased um, within Bledisloe House, and we're practicing the safe uh, workplace management uh, protocols, uh, maintaining social distancing and maintaining separations between two floors so that we ensure operational uh, continuity if there is some um, infection with the virus. And operating in tandem but separated from the ECC, we have our um, so the regional isolation and quarantine coordination cell um, is operating mostly on the, on the ninth floor, so that's the, typically the separation uh, we're, we're, we've got. Um, in terms of caring for communities, uh, our response through the 0800 number continues to be predominantly focused on non-health related welfare needs for Aucklanders uh, across the region. Uh, our Welfare Food Parcel Initiative, which has now been running for four weeks, has taken almost 30,000 calls through the Auckland Council Call Centre and resulted in more than uh, 15,500 uh, requests for assistance. Uh, as of midnight last evening, uh, last night, we had dispatched over 20,000 packages, uh, supporting over 11,000 uh, households across Auckland. Of those packages, 16,000 were food packages and 4,000 were essential uh, boxes of supplies. Uh, the food packages typically uh, include two boxes of non-perishable food um, and a, number, a range of products to meet people's um, Reasonably simple um, dietary needs, uh, so um, that's that's going well. We do have um, a heat map that we can circulate after this meeting to members to show the general distribution of that of that welfare support, and you'll see it on your screen now. Thank you, Sandra. Um, there has been a backlog in deliveries uh, around the, the sort of uh, public holidays we've had, Easter weekend and Anzac weekend. Uh, yesterday, um, of around 3,000 uh, food packages, yesterday 1,700 of that backlog were dispatched from the Spark, Ar Spark Arena uh, Dispatch Centre, um, and we expect those, all of that backlog to be um, caught up by the end of the week. Um, as you're aware, many Aucklanders are still facing significant challenges uh, of circumstance and our teams continue to coordinate the support to connect callers to the services they require, um, along with our partners um, from uh, all of gov an all-of-government approach, uh, particularly health um, and MSD. 
Uh, we still have only a small number of complaints which our team continue to manage in a respectful manner, manner um, and that process is working well, making sure that we take a customer-led approach. Um, uh, we would just acknowledge though that this, um, this significant community support also being delivered in addition to the work that's coming through and support coming through the Council's 0800 number um, by other community organisations, some of whom are supported through uh, civil defence and emergency management um, and other central government agencies. But that community support through food banks and marae um, is, is significant. Uh, just talking about the uh, Regional Isolation and Quarantine Coordination Centre, so we, um, as we mentioned last week, uh, this work stream is working alongside our Emergency uh, Coordination Centre in Bledisloe House and includes representatives from a number of other partner agencies, uh, Ministry of Health, New Zealand Defence Force, New Zealand Police, uh, airport agencies and other government, central government agencies. Um, and it's largely focused on implementing uh, the required mandatory 14-day isolation conditions. Uh, currently we have, um, as of last evening, 2,855 people in managed isolation and 125 in quarantine um, across 11 hotels in, in Auckland. Uh, this number changes daily, as you would expect, uh, with, as people reach their 14 day anniversaries and new flights arrive uh, of returning New Zealanders and citizens. Uh, to assist with some of the welfare needs of, of the people who are in isolation and quarantine, we have nine navigators from the Family Works Northern and the Anglican Trust for Women and Children um, supporting the welfare needs of guests in isolation and quarantine. Uh, by connecting them with uh, essential information and support services whilst they're in isolation and thinking about their needs as they, as they may depart from isolation um, and our care. Now, the primary referral pathway is via the on-site nurses uh, who are in the hotels who undertake daily wellbeing checks uh, with guests and the navigators have so far received 204 referrals for welfare support uh, for guests. Uh, with nine of the 12 managed isolation hotels in the Auckland city centre, um, you may personally have noticed if you've been getting out and about um, uh, that uh, or seen media reports of guests taking gentle exercise in nearby parks and open spaces. Uh, and guests in the managed isolation do not have any symptoms of COVID-19, but all the same follow the physical distancing rules as others in Alert Level 3. Uh, these walks or gentle exercises are supervised by our aviation security partners and we know these short breaks in the outdoors are really important for our guests' wellbeing. Um, I would also mention that, and as you will have noticed in, in media, there have been a um, majority of people are coping well being in isolation for two weeks but there are some exceptions to that, um, and that's where the navigators uh, play an important role along with our partners, particularly the Ministry of Health, um, New Zealand Defence Force and Aviation Security in ensuring that their welfare needs are being, are being met. Uh, so um, I think that's important um, where, it, where it comes to food, those other welfare needs, or indeed assisting people to go through um, any appeal processes which the Ministry of Health make those decisions in terms of isolation. Um, te, te pau whakarai, um, as, you, as you've heard before, we've stood up a Māori specific function in the emergency coordination centre structure to work with Māori communities. I think this has been uh, very successful. Uh, uh, certainly across New Zealand, uh, we have received uh, quite a few calls to um, see if that this can be emulated across other emergency management centres. Uh, Te Pau Whakarai continues to do outreach programme to marae, iwi and mātāwaka organisations um, and support to date has included uh, 13 staff from Count Auckland Council's Māori staff network uh, making outreach calls to 1,500 uh, vulnerable Māori seniors 
um, an increase from 700 of from the 700 reported previously um, on behalf of uh, Ministry of Social Development. Uh, staff have also advised that Kaumatu and Kui are reporting good health and in support networks of the 400 calls, a low number of referrals for welfare, for food, or kai have been requested. Uh, the staff group is continuing to contact Iwi, Matawaka, and Marae to check and identify welfare needs. As of yesterday, uh, 1,239 food parcels and hygiene packs were delivered to Fana on behalf of, of a number of Marae across, across Tamaki Makoto, um, including cleaning and sanitation packs um, to keep people safe, uh, delivered to 13 Marae providing essential community services. Um, just um, some other general information that uh, you, you may have been aware of as well, but Auckland Transport Operations Centre has developed traffic management plans uh, to manage traffic near high-risk sites uh, like interchanges, schools, community-based assessment centres, uh, hospitals, and also drive-through uh, fast food outlets uh, for the move to Alert Level 3. Um, these emergency speed limits have been put in place for to reduce speed limits to down to 30 kilometres an hour in those high risk sites. And additionally, Queen Street uh, in Auckland has been restricted to buses only, no cars. Uh, we are ma also maintaining a watching brief on, on the water supply status um, as an emergency management centre and remain ready to um, stand up for the emergency response if that should be required um, together, with, together with water care and others. Uh, just as a final word, uh, Worship and councillors, I'd like to again acknowledge um, the dedication of the Auckland Emergency Management staff, uh, other council staff of a relatively significant number, and our partner agencies working on this response. Uh, it's been outstanding. The operation continues to run daily um, from mid March uh, for 12 hours a day in the office and, and also through, through into um, longer than that where needs arise particularly with people in isolation and quarantine hotels. Um, and most importantly, we really appreciate your support, but the support of other parts of the organisation and the community as well at, at uh, delivering welfare and response um, to Aucklanders. Thank you very much for your time. Happy to take a few questions. Yeah, thanks, May. So just before we come to questions to you, maybe I'll get Ian and Phil to make their contributions and we'll take the questions together. Um, brief update I got from Auckland Transport last night. Uh, first two days of Level 3, the patronage has risen from 16,000 a day to about 35,000 a day. Uh, that's still only 10% of the normal, uh, but people starting to resume use of, uh, of public transport and with strict separation requirements. So there's a, a cap put on how many people can travel in carriages and on buses. Um, the motorway at 6 o'clock this morning was starting to look a bit more like normal, so you're seeing a whole lot more people back at work. And I just wanted finally to uh, give a big thank you to 70 librarians who between them made calls to over 15,000 over 70 year olds who were living alone uh, without any internet connection. And you know, really good feedback on that. People really pleased to be, to be contacted. And, and fortunately, not, not a lot of distress. There were, I think, maybe three to 400 requests for food parcels and, and other uh, social assistance, but generally people were coping quite well. Um, Ian, I think if we come to you next and uh, ask you to report, or do you want to, Phil, do you want to go first? Phil, in his new role that we gave him last week, formerly of Recovery Manager. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, so, um, councillors, just a quick update from me really today and probably some more detail and more of a, refocus, uh, more of a focus on recovery going forward. But just quickly, so what happens with these um, situations is that we need to transition at the right time from response to recovery activity. That's that's what we're working through at the moment. That's what the planning is around. Um, 
Um, being honest, um, I'm getting my head around that and the formal um, structures, um, responsibilities and so on that apply. Um, and hence we'll have some more detail um, probably next week. Um, for your information, we are expecting um, um, some direction, some requirements from the National Emergency Management Agency. Um, um, Council will have some explicit responsibilities in the recovery phase that are handed down to us and which are likely to be um, captured in some bespoke legislation um, that we're expecting um, in the not too distant future, um, i.e. that sets out some um, particular responsibilities that we will have going forward for recovery. Um, you will understand that recovery in this situation probably looks slightly different to what might have been envisaged for certain other emergency situations. It's probably longer term. It's probably more concerned with um, um, economic and social recovery, um, dealing with um, employment um, and, and so on. So look, um, in simple terms, we're doing planning now um, and looking at what um, um, activities, what structure, what roles and so on are required. Um, importantly, we need to make sure that this isn't confusing, um, that there is really clear responsibilities as to who is doing what. Um, so I mentioned the formal emergency management response. Um, there needs to be alignment and clarity about what Auckland Council is doing in terms of its um, traditional role. Um, but so too it needs to um, deal with the role that the community itself, that NGOs, that other um, government agencies play in the recovery space um, going forward. And look, just finally, um, the other leg to the stool that we are um, um, looking at is really the civic leadership um, that's um, going to be required on an ongoing basis. And there's an important role, a very important role for the Mayor and yourselves to play there. Um, so we're doing some thinking about that. Um, um, a campaign, if you like, where we're, we're clear um, with and for the community that um, a solid plan does exist, um, that these are the areas we're focused on. I mentioned employment, um, economic recovery and so on um, to, to call out two of those, um, and that we're messaging the uh, very real ongoing concern for the uh, community's recovery. And, and that's sort of, if you like, the purpose that um, um, sits above our recovery planning. So look, more news to follow and uh, I'll leave it there for now. Um, thank you very much for that, Phil. Um, you mentioned that there's legislation before Parliament. Just to let members know, I, I got um, I finally got a, a message back from Carmel Cipollone last night that next week uh, the Parliament will be putting through all its stages uh, on Tuesday and Wednesday legislation to enable uh, those councillors who wish to return a percentage of their, their salary to the council uh, to do so. Um, I've had a number of inquiries, uh, including I think from Cathy around that. So uh, that legislation will mean that if we choose, uh, we can um, give some of our salary back for that six month period uh, if people haven't already made alternative arrangements around donations to charity. Um, Ian, do you want to add uh, sure. further to that? Thank sure, you. look, um, look uh, I expect you're getting the impression that uh, we are moving from a situation of trying to deal with, a, I suppose, an immediate health issue to a situation where we are trying to uh, a deal with a recovery and it's a very much a, a focus around economic and, and social issues as, as we move into the future and if you've got that impression that's exactly what we want to try and present and in a way where we are now within our own organisation is also moving away from a situation where uh, we are moving back uh, to a new normal, a new way of operating. So I'll just try and highlight uh, where we are with respect to some of those. So as of this week, we had no further COVID cases. We've only had three in total right across our group, um, and all those folk are recovering. Uh, the essential services which were operating at a level four have con are continuing to operate, and those new services which commenced this week on Monday, they largely uh, involve field workers, inspectors, 
um, uh, noise control officers, those sorts of uh, activities associated with, with the economy sort of getting back on its feet, uh, but also people uh, who are associated with our capital works and, and maintenance programs. Right across council group, uh, we've had no issues in terms of moving to level three. So we've got more staff who have come on board around um, those capital projects and maintenance programs recommencing. Um, th some of those projects have taken a little while to kick off uh, because of the new health and safety requirements for those, um, for those works on the ground to actually get um, undertaken. With water care, you're aware following Ravine's uh, presentation last week around the drought issues, the emergency tankers uh, targeting um, household water tanks are stopped work so this week. So the, um, the, 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 the small um, water tanks have been recharged, but the issue with our major water supply exists and is serious, uh, and so we can expect a bit more on that as we move down the levels as Ravine outlined last week. Uh, today we have some 626 staff who have come, who are now working back at council. So many of these are field staff, many of them are rostered, so there are minimal numbers at once in any particular location. And we are also tracking our staff. So this is currently based on um, personal diaries. So you may have heard in the media uh, the importance of being able to track and trace people's movements should a COVID uh, situation uh, come about. We need to know who people have contacted. So at the moment, that's based on a sort of a diary system, keeping a record of who you've met and when. Uh, but we're also moving towards a technology-based approach. And we'll be using uh, access cards, um, controlling access within our buildings so people need to use cards so we know what floors people are on and also where telephones and other devices are connected so we're able to to, to monitor that so those activities the technology based approaches will be available by the time we move to level two we've also um, uh, recommenced our capital works projects, particularly those that are subject to contracts as well as maintenance. Uh, and that, that also includes, we've opened up a number of additional toilets, which have been an issue for some of our, particularly some of our uh, more remote communities. Uh, and we've got a staged recommencement on how we deploy, um, and how we actually deploy that as the COVID health and safety measures are developed. So we, along with all of our contractors, et cetera, have had to deploy training programs for our staff in terms of new ways of working, but that's well underway and you're, you're starting to see people getting back to work now. At level three, all people who can work from home will continue to work from home. So we have around 6,500 people working from home at the moment. And um, you may be pleased to know that we're starting to deploy Microsoft Teams to replace the Skype system, which I know has caused some issues uh, over the last sort of few days and weeks. And so we're moving to a, 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 a perhaps an improved system of being able to, to communicate with those folk who are working remotely because that is certainly an issue we want to try and continue into the future, the opportunity for people to work uh, at home more often than perhaps what they were doing six months ago. So looking ahead to alert level two, so we're, th th we're looking at what services we can reopen safely. So there are still issues at alert level two around mass gatherings. And if you recall, uh, when we first started on this, on this process, uh, we started at alert level two, and there were issues around events and theatres and maintaining physical distances at pools and libraries, and actually the ability to tr track and trace people. So that's an important part, important part of the decision process about what type of services we can actually recommence uh, at level two. And also the other issue we have is do we actually have the staff to reopen all of those services as they were operating? There is still a group of staff who are vulnerable, who are at risk uh, to the COVID um, virus, and they are required to remain at home during level two. We're still determining how many and where those staff are working, but that's underway. And we've also got staff who will be seconded on an ongoing basis to the response and recovery um, uh, processes that Mace and Phil have outlined. It's, uh, Auckland is one of those parts of, of New Zealand where uh, perhaps the risk of COVID is higher or the issues associated with the, um, with the social and economic recovery are more pronounced. And so the emergency operation and coordination centres are likely to continue into the future. And so we'll be continuing to have to provide staff to those, um, to those activities.
And there's also the question around resourcing and funding. And as you're aware, we are facing an emergency uh, annual plan and budget for 2020-21. And this needs to reflect the reduced income, particularly around um, user charges and dividends and rental income and fuel taxes and so forth. And that's got the potential to... Um, to reduce uh, the, the well, will reduce the amount of income we've got available to actually apply to our services. And Auckland Council is unusual. If you look across uh, all local authorities uh, in New Zealand, we have a high proportion or a relatively high proportion of our income based on non-rates revenue, such as those I've just outlined. So we're more exposed to market conditions. So the so the impact of the economic situation is more pronounced for Auckland than perhaps for many other local councils across New Zealand. So we are looking at work, or we are undertaking work now, taking into account uh, those financial constraints, but also those staffing and health related issues as to what uh, services that we can open uh, at the commencement of level two. And we need to be a, we need to adopt a, a prudent approach to this in terms of uh, opening up and maybe committing uh, resources which we may not have in the future. So look, in the next uh, week or so, uh, you're, you'll be experiencing and undertaking um, uh, workshops and discussions around the financial situation, and associated with that will be a review of the services and the nature of the services we can open. And. Um, Longer term, we'll need to look at those sorts of issues as part of the of the long term plan. So, look, I'll stop there. And look, if there's any questions for Mace, Phil, and myself, we'd be only too pleased to respond. Uh, thank you very much, Ian. And uh, I think with the pre three presentations from Mace, uh, Phil, and Ian, there's uh, a lot of information. Um, what, I, what I'll do for this section is just go through the role because I'm sure that people will will have uh, many people will have questions. Um, I'll integrate the the question and comment section together so we just get one bite of the cherry. So if you've got a comment to make, please keep it as concise as possible, uh, with a focus particularly on questions. So uh, I'll start at the the bottom of the uh, of the roll at the moment. Um, Councillor Paul Young, any comment or question? Uh, thank you, everybody's effort during this period. I think that from our Auckland Council point of view, like the mayor make a public announcement to, because there's still some behavior we need to notice and inform our Auckland keep uh, behavior. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Paul. I think if everybody on their Facebook and other social media sites can just emphasise that, hey, we're not back to normal yet, we're not out of the woods yet, we've achieved so much, but don't put it at risk now. And, uh, you know, that it, we, we work by social compliance, and by and large people have been good, but, but not everyone. So thank you for that point, Paul. Um, Glenn Wilcox. Uh, just one question, Mr Mayor, and that's directed towards Ian. Uh, talk about uh, resourcing. I just want to understand in my own mind, and this may have already been spoken about, um, is, there, is the resourcing for more staff or else actually the secondment of staff, is that coming out of council funds or is that being uh, directed from other areas? So look, thank you. Um so in terms of Auckland Council, indeed all local authorities, have a requirement to, um, of part of their normal role to uh, support the operations of, for example, the Emergency Coordination Centre. So in Auckland we have a mix of people. We have people who are employed in, our, in the office, and you'll obviously be, you've worked alongside a number of those, but we've also got staff such as those librarians and um, indeed other people from across our organisation who are supporting them. And those are people seconded in, and it's my understanding that um, that's a cost to council. Uh, there are some costs that, or for example, housing uh, those folk who are in isolation or feeding um, or providing those food packs. Costs associated with that type of activity is reimbursed um, by central government, but the cost of, of council staff uh, seconded or working in association with the uh, coordination centre is not. Thank you very much for that. Uh, John Watson. Um, yeah, thanks, Mr Mayor. And um, just uh, two quick questions. One in respect of uh, you know your quite apt analogy there of you know schools out, um, which, which has certainly been the 
the response in, in, in parts of Auckland, it, it, certainly in the news media, that I don't think that's been handled very well at all. It's, it's that kind of almost joyous celebration. But there are people congregating um, a lot more now, and, and even if they are keeping their social distancing, um, I, and I'm thinking of places like Hori, where I don't think there's any toilets open yet. I, I, I'm not sure there wasn't at the last time I checked. Is there is there any plan then to to open up a few more toilets while still trying to you know retain that restrictive um, kind of c- compliance? Um, I know I think it was Ian mentioned that there was some thought going into that, but um, I'd just be interested in a few more details on that and. The other one question to Mace in terms of the heat maps. Thank you. Thanks very much. That they're, they're useful. I wonder if if uh, we're in a position also to get a little bit more data about the, the the other agencies that are involved. So we have the Salvation Army and some communities like like ours that have a group called Love Soup that are really accurate. So we get a kind of a fuller sense of of how many packs are going out. I'm assuming that. People aren't going around multiple agencies. There might be a couple doing that, but to get that more accurate picture of the need in the community, you really have to tie those, uh, you know, all the people that are together if they have that sort of information. Right. Two questions here. Maybe the first one to you, Ian, um, about it, opening toilets, and then to Mace on the yeah, food banks. I'll just is, is Claudia on the line? If she's not, I can answer the question. I am on the line, but my apologies, I missed the question. Oh, Claudia, okay. Everyone. So. Um, it's, it's about toilets and about opening of toilets. So I'm aware that uh, we have opened some additional toilets, um, uh, and that's been in response to some specific issues. In general, um, we're trying to limit the number of toilets opened across the city, uh, primarily to try and encourage people to, to stay to stay local, really. Um, but look, it, it, it's, it is a balancing act, and there are issues that emerge from day to day, which, which I know Claudia and her team are, are managing. And um, just to give you an update, we've now added 60 additional toilets, so we've got 140 open in total. Thank you very much. Um, we can't be specific about Oriwa, uh, John, but we might be able to find that out for you. I, uh, okay. the, uh, unless you've got that information there, Claudia. I, I can send a message on the side, on the sidebar, when I've found the information for you, which I'll look up now. Thank you very Thank much. You. And the question of food banks, um, uh, Mace, if you can run through, yeah. because uh, we will be looking at transitioning out of the distribution centre, perhaps by the time we get to uh, level two. Um, can you talk a little bit about what assistance is being given to other food banks and how we're working with them? Um, certainly. Thank you, Your Worship, and thanks for the question, Councillor Watson. Uh, we don't have a centralised database of total food packages, but we are gathering that. Um, from from those other agencies and other community other community groups, but as um, the mayor mentioned, we are looking to transition from what was considered to be a bridge um, until other community agencies and central government agencies could respond to the emergency over the next uh, two to three weeks at, at the most. We know there could be a little bit of a tail on that, um, but we will be able to provide an updated update a report in due course. Um, in general, though, there's um, a significant, probably matching um, at least the numbers uh, that I've mentioned today being delivered through community, the community as well, <coughs> and an ongoing, an ongoing demand for, for some time. Thank you, Mace. Uh, Wayne Walker. OK. Uh, hear me OK, Phil? Yep, good. good. Uh, so two or three things. Um, Ian, you mentioned preparedness around um, level two and things that can open, things that can open under different circumstances and so on. What's the timing like around advising us what that looks like? And I'm conscious that that may well be a work in progress in itself. Yes, thank you. Uh, That work is in progress and we're expecting to be able to come back to councillors next week. The other issue that I'd put to you that um, I experienced directly is around uh, water, uh, because I'm on water tanks and so are many people in the community. That issue has not gone away because there has not been sufficient rain. And 
I would recommend that some task force be put in place around that because there are a number of people that are very, very stressed out around that issue and COVID has accentuated it. Uh, the other comment that I'd make um, really just uh, runs on from um, John Watson. I'm directly involved with a, a food bank that's been operating for you know some years now in the community. And I am concerned that when the council facility winds down, these other facilities may well need to be ramped up more because there is a growing need there. And I certainly experience that directly. Okay, thank you. Two questions there, one about uh, water tankers and about uh, ramping up support uh, post the closure of the distribution centre to food banks. Um, so, maybe Ian on the water tankers <laughs> and uh, Mace on the food, uh, the food okay. bank question. So look, thank you. Um, so with respect to the water tankers, I, what I was talking about was the, I suppose, the emergency supplies provided to water tankers from our, from our facility. So clearly there is, there remains the normal uh, supplies through the normal water care channels for water tankers to refill. Um, uh, household water tanks. Um, it was just those extra measures that were felt to be not required any further, and, and I understand we're, we're closed on Tuesday. Thank you. And a question to Mace about the food banks, about the support we're giving to the food banks and what will happen in the future. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. And so in the, the main issue that's being dealt with now is working with a network of networks, if you like, of food banks and other community organisations um, to ensure that they are able to uh, mobilise to a greater level um, and uh, assessing that, that level of need and demand um, in, into the future, with, particularly with Ministry of Social Development. Uh, so there is, there is significant work being undertaken in that area and a number of contracts um, are, being, are being let with uh, grant support. We intend to run some of those contracts through our council smarty grant system so we keep track of them and, and get a much better understanding of how we're supporting. There is other support into those organisations from organisation or um, support mechanisms such as whānau ora uh, as well. So um, certainly Council Walker, um, I understand the issue and we are scoping what the future need will be in over quite some significant time. Thank you, Mace. Uh, David Taipuri. Uh, kia ora, Your Worship. I haven't got any questions or comments about today, but just to reiterate that um, I'm hopeful that sooner or later that the Council and Independent Māori Statutory Board can meet to discuss the matters of the raised at previous meetings. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, David. I, I understand that um, IMSB and uh, my office is trying to find uh, a suitable date for that to happen uh, at an early opportunity. Um, thank you. Uh, Sharon Stewart. Uh, thank you. Just um, thank you for everything that you're doing. But you, you were mentioning that a lot of the staff that have been unable to carry out um, their normal duties, that's the librarians and, and um, consenting staff and, and so forth, um, you mentioned that there's going to be an extra cost. Can you, can you tell us what the extra cost is and, and um, yeah, can you just explain that, please? Yes, look, it's, um, I'm not sure I mentioned that there was an extra cost. I'm, what I was saying was that, for example, those librarians paid for by council to undertake library services, uh, while they've um, not been able to undertake those services with, uh, with at the request of the Ministry for Social Development, we've had them ringing around uh, some of the, those vulnerable, 1,500 odd vulnerable um, uh, people across Auckland. The council is still maintaining, if you like, payments to those librarians. And um, that's part of the emergency response. And it's expected that uh, staff members are seconded across to undertake these activities. And that's not reimbursed by um, by central government, and I was contrasting that to the situation where we may have to hire a hotel in order to accommodate uh, those in isolation and the costs of the hotel and feeding um, the, the people in the hotel, etc., is, is all reimbursed by council. So there's, there's no extra costs associated with council staff um, undertaking work, but we are paying for, the, um, f the, the, for those staff to undertake that work. 
Oh, thank you very much for that. Thank you. I think those call numbers were 50,000. Yes, sorry. <laughs> Oh, sorry, I had my mic off then. Um, I, I was just uh, saying that the, the call numbers made were 15,000, not 1,500, just to fully recognise the work our librarians did. Um, Desley uh, Simpson, do you have a question? Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. I've got two quick questions. Are all the staff who would normally deploy, be deployed doing something else, are, the, are all of them being actively employed doing other things? That's my first question. Or do we have people that were working in, in something that is no longer operating, not doing anything? It'll, it's Ian Maxwell. Um, look, thank you for the question. So it, it's a mixture. So we are, so for example, if I, if I use librarians as an example, um, clearly they have not been able to undertake their normal role in libraries. And where possible, we have been um, redeploying those people into activities such as calling and, and indeed other things. But yes, I'm sure there are people, uh, staff across our organisation that have been unable to um, undertake their normal activities. Uh, they may have been engaged in training and development and that type of thing, but they have not been able to undertake their normal activities. Okay, thank you. I'd like some more on that later. Um, and my second question is just around Auckland Transport. It's great that they've gone from 16,000 um, public transport movements a day up to 35, which is still, um, you know, 10% of normal. Do they envisage that daily rate going up during um, alert level three, or is there any modelling that they're doing, or they just don't know yet? Um, oh, they have been undertaking modelling, um, and yes, there is an expectation it will rise. But however, we are in a situation which is unusual and novel. Um, and if we look overseas, uh, the practice has been that the return to public transport has been comparatively slow. Um, so uh, it's, it's an unknown situation, but they are modelling it as, as best they can. OK, and just finally, sorry, are you going to send your notes out like you've done before? Because I can't write fast enough. Yes. Yep. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, uh, Greg Sayers. Uh, uh, thank you, Your Worship, and thank you for your um, um, opening comments at the start of the meeting. I haven't got any questions, just uh, maybe a comment um, how helpful the information has been today, and just want to congratulate the presenters. And also, I uh, just really wanted to reflect us back on the words of, uh, of Mace's around um, that his very heartfelt comments around how well the staff and the organisation is performing. I think we all, I think we all heard that um, very clearly, uh, May. So uh, thank you for mentioning that, and I'm, I'm pleased that you're pleased. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Greg. Uh, and I think the thank you comes from from all of us to the staff involved in those activities. They've uh, they've volunteered to do uh, stuff. With a little bit of time on their hands, they, they've used their skills, and that's uh, that's been really helpful in making sure that we're not missing out on people. We just didn't know what was happening with those over 70-year-olds, um, and we were pleasantly surprised that actually so many of them were coping uh, so well. Uh, Daniel Newman. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and thank you to the officers for the very good work. Can I ask um, that we get some information shortly in terms of um, how the uh, how we will look to open and to operate a couple of um, important regional facilities as we move from level three down to level two. I would imagine the information will be short forthcoming, but I'm, I speak specifically about the Auckland Botanic Gardens, um, uh, the zoo, um, the art gallery, and the museums. So I know the information is not available yet, but I'd be very keen to understand um, even um, when they do open uh, how those um, very important regional assets will operate to ensure that we can still ensure physical distancing and, and try and uh, maximise the safety of the visitors to those facilities. So if that information can be, I could, if I could request some information as to how that will work, I'd be very grateful. We can certainly, oh sorry. We can certainly provide that. Um, the RFA 
is uh, obviously responsible for the zoo, the art gallery and the museums. And I know they're working uh, with central government now around um, exactly what are the sort of requirements in terms of actually not only those sorts of activities, but things like theatres as well, which will have implications um, uh, nationally. Uh, so we can get that information uh, to you. Yeah, I think that'd be really good. I think with physical distancing, particularly things like the botanic gardens, um, might be good to try to get those opened uh, earlier rather than later. Uh, Tracy Mulholland. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I don't have any uh, questions or comments, only the acknowledgement of the support that we have received from all. Kia ora. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, Richard Hills. Uh, thank you. No, that's it's just massive what um, staff are doing, and thank you, Ian, and others for uh, really ramping up this work. It would be good, and not to show off or anything, but to to actually show uh, more of the public if we could get some infographics or or something to show. You know, the phenomenal numbers of 20,000 food parcels and 50,000 calls, and and if if there's any way that we can show people what's available still, but also what it, what council is doing to support. Uh, our communities and especially our staff working in, um, you know, putting themselves at risk at this time as well, if there was any way for us to do that. What I did want to ask is how um, creative are we getting around redeploying staff or even permanently to maybe government ministries or different things going on if this change continues, uh, if there's ways we are connecting people with other employment um kind of in a seamless way if possible, being uh, I know that contracts and different things under normal circumstances, you couldn't do that, but I guess that's changing. And the other thing around, we've had a Zoom call with some of our cleaners a couple nights ago, and they're all just on the wage subsidy because they're contracted, so I, um, as they're not doing the work, they're not being paid. So um, I just wonder how we are trying to connect some of our contractors who work full-time with us, so it technically feel like full-time staff, how they are being may, maybe redeployed or helped with government agencies or even private, you know, are we looking at McDonald's and other places which are overrun right now, supermarkets and connecting our contractors who are, who are you know, on minimum wage usually but are on very less, how we could possibly do that um, at the same time just so we're helping our most vulnerable people, workers, and also encouraging them to come back um, when the time is appropriate. Thank you, uh, Richard. I don't know, Ian, whether you can give an answer to that one. Um, it's I, not just our cleaners, of course. No. It'd be a whole wide range of people, RFA, et cetera, that uh, we employ uh, or we, we work for us through contractors. So the implications, our, our ability to redirect them may be limited, mm -hmm. and our ability to um, bridge the, the government subsidy up to the normal full wage uh, would be uh, would be pretty difficult too. But Ian, is there anything you can comment on that? Or we uh, might, might be able to get somebody to come back with more specialist knowledge in yes. that area. Yes, look, it's, um, I suppose it's fair to say, look, uh, up until quite recently, our focus has been very much on the health issues and managing through that. And, and we are clearly, all of us are now thinking about the future and recovery. And so that, that, that sort of innovation um, is definitely going to be required. We're going to have to work extremely closely with a whole range of community and government agencies uh, to, to get our community sort of back back strongly. Um, so look, all of those concepts and ideas, but look, it's fair to say that we, I don't have a ready answer to, the, to that particular question right now. Thank you very much. Shane Henderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'm just kind of thinking out loud uh, this morning, but I'm aware that there are increasing demands on our mental health um, services with the COVID responses and all that. So um, does Council have a broad role in addressing mental health needs uh, further going into the future and as we come out of these levels? The, um, the, sh the short answer is no. Um, it's primary, mental health is primarily or it is primarily the responsibility of the Ministry for Health and, and central government have enhanced funding in that area that will go via the Ministry of Health to a range of agencies. I suppose what we do have is things like open spaces and um, places where people can go to to get, sort of get away from it all. And so, so we, we play a role, but it's in that sort of area. It's certainly not in the, in the sort of the, the, the technical element of, of mental health. That's, that's the responsibility of uh, the Ministry for Health. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. 
Uh, Chris Fletcher. Your Worship, thank, thank you. Um, my question is directed to Phil Wilson um, in terms of looking ahead in recovery. Um, you're, you're in that capacity for the whole council family, I take it. So, so the specific concern I've got is even where the planned works, where do we bring common sense and practicality in? I've had a number of people contact me this morning over what they see as the insensitivity of coning off Ponsonby Road, just as cafes and small businesses are trying to get their feet under the table again as small traders. Um, can we, even where there might be planned works and policy in place, are we looking at the, the issues around compassion and public relations for just the implementation of those works so that we're not, um, you know, we're not falling out? It, it strikes me as a little bit insensitive that we we are just as people are opening up, we're sort of closing things down um, as regards car parks and so forth. So just would really appreciate your comments on how you can kind of oversee the transition that we put in place the right policies, but, but we also take into account people's circumstances. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, look, to be honest, I don't know that the recovery planning will extend to um, asserting an oversight of that type of decision. I, I'm, I'd be happy to... Um, to that level Sorry, of... Sorry, I've uh, you. I think you cut out, Phil, on the first part of that, so maybe if you just start the sentence again, please. Oh, apologies. Um, I was saying that uh, I don't think the um, recovery response will assert to that level of detail a responsibility for, um, you know, that type of decision. I, I'm happy to uh, take that offline to Auckland Transport and convey the sentiment and, and perhaps some broader expectations. But to be clear, the recovery effort's not going to um, um, start um, dictating to Auckland Transport um, how they roll out certain of their projects. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Phil. I mean, I don't want to see you doing that at all. But, but what, I'm, what I'm asking for is when we look to economic recovery, just as we put a lens over certain things that we want waiting on, should we not look and make sure that whatever policies are being put in place, that we keep that economic lens um, on the recovery and make sure that we, you know, we, we're not taking lives more difficult um, for our small businesses. Can't hear. Oh, um, yeah, I'm not. I can hear Phil because he's in the same room, but I'm not sure that that uh, is is coming across. And Chris, your line was breaking up a bit as well. Um, can I get you to say the same thing again, a, a little bit more succinctly, Phil? I'm happy to take it offline with Phil, okay. but I just okay. think there is economic lens that we need. Yeah, Chris, your line's, break, your line's breaking up as well. Can I take, pick up your suggestion that you and Phil talk offline about that? That, that would be helpful. Uh, Councillor Alf Filipina. Thank you, Your Worship. I've got three quick questions in there, uh, mainly to Mace, um, so I'll ask them very quickly. Um, Mace, in regards to the 0800 number, um, what delays are we having in regards to answering the calls? Um, and do you want me to say the other two questions? Uh, maybe we'll take them one at a time, um, and then Mace uh, can, can uh, focus on each one. Mace? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Councillor Filipina, we've got, got those to, or time to answer is, is right down to less than 30 seconds now. Okay. Um, uh, the other question is, 
Uh, once the emergency declaration, if on the 6th of May uh, is no longer, um, does that mean our 0800 number stops? Because I think we'll find that uh, that's when the need is, is more um, post uh, the emergency declaration. Um, so, Councillor Filipina, we, as, as I mentioned, we are moving to a transition to more community-based, supporting the community-based um, organisations who give welfare support. However, um, I, we envisage that the 0800 number will remain open for some time and people will be directed to the appropriate agency or organisation who can support their needs. Uh, central Government has made available uh, 30, 30 million dollars last week across New Zealand to support ongoing uh, wealth, welfare needs for essential supplies and food. Um, so that excludes the other um, health welfare needs. Thank you. Uh, Alf, you had a third question. Yeah, uh, last one, uh, Your Worship. And, and Mace, um, are we at this stage, based on what you've just said, are we telling people um, that we no longer take um, either calls or orders for food parcels or essential um, uh, welfare um, calls um, because I'm getting now, as, as of this morning anyway, three um, calls saying that that is what people are receiving? Uh, no, we haven't moved to that transition, so we're still, make, still taking those calls for, for welfare food, um, but we will be changing our messaging within as we move to Alert Level 2. Thank you. Uh, Chris Darby. Thanks, thanks, Mayor. Um, look, just following up on Councillor Filipina's uh, line of inquiry there, um, the heat map that's just been distributed to us uh, via email, Mace, is that the is that a reflection of the demand that's come through our system? It's not the NGOs. Uh, yes, uh, Councillor Darby, that's that's correct. It is solely the demand that's come through our system, but I would say largely that reflects um, the nature of the demand across across the region. Yeah, Mayor, look, just briefly, I think, look, it's great to see that uh, significant contribution coming in from government, but my feeling is we're going to have to keep a very close eye on this um, Level 3 and Level 2. Um, I attended the North Shore Sikh Society food parcel delivery on Saturday afternoon, which was supposed to be for an hour, and the queue of cars was across the hill and out of sight for an hour and a half, uh, and I was quite surprised uh, to see the, num the, the demand for, you know, a modest food parcel. And it sort of says to me that the enormity of this problem is only going to grow as the wage subsidy runs out and the redundancy notices start to roll in. So um, I think we need to have a... A, a bit of a rain check on this one. We need to be having a, a very close eye on it. Yeah, my, my guess is that um, there will be a time delay. Uh, certainly when uh, the, the wage subsidy runs out, that may mean a number of those people being laid off. We've seen the figures in the United States as to what's happened to growth uh, there, the, the largest drop in growth in uh, in, in a quarter since uh, 1989, and that was just with one month impact. And there's no reason to suspect that we'll be spared um, a, a lot of the effect of that here. So I think the, the need to provide that urgent assistance uh, by way of food parcels will be ongoing, uh, even, even beyond the uh, re reduction to, to level two. Uh, so that may be, however, not through a distribution centre as we're doing now, uh, but through uh, additional assistance through the food banks. But uh, a, a fair point I think you've made. Uh, Angela Dalton. Oh, thank you, Your Worship. And it's really just following up on what you've just spoken about. So I, I also have significant concerns about the ceasing of that central food bank. 
And um, Mace, thank you for the heat map. And I can hear what you're saying about the transition and how you're getting the information from some of the existing food banks, perhaps. But we have so many groups that have stepped into the space that were not traditionally providing food parcels. And I want to make sure that we are absolutely gathering the, the need and uh, the gap that is going to be presented once uh, central transitions out of supplying the food parcels. I'd like to, if I can, have an offline conversation about it. And I'd like to understand how we're going to make sure that um, certainly the local board chairs in the south have some oversight because they're the ones that are going to be f filling this gap through coordination of existing groups in some, in some way. But I do hold a significant concern. Sorry, Angela, we just lost your last half sentence. You said you have a significant concern, and it sounded like it was going to be quite important. So would you like to repeat that? I think we might have Sorry. lost. Yeah, oh, you, you we've just, got you back, yeah, Angela. Yep. Yeah, I'm back. Yeah. So, so you my had a question, significant I guess, concern. Yeah, yeah my, my, my question is, can I have an offline conversation with Mace regarding the food parcels? and how we're going to try and ensure that that gap is not so great by missing information of what is happening on the ground. Councillor Darby made a really good point about the Sikhs and the thousands and thousands of parcels that are going out every week, but also are other groups who are not traditionally in the food parcel space that have stepped in there and have been getting support to be able to fill a gap, but that will go. And what does that look like? Yeah, I, I think... I think that's a good conversation to, to have and uh, to make sure that we have got proper coordination between the food banks and that we are to the extent possible using those that have experience in this area because uh, they're, they're doing the triaging to find out what people's actual needs are like uh, Daryl Evans and Mangari. Uh, before you get the food parcel they want to know what your circumstances are and how they can help uh, deal with the cause of your need for the food parcel. Um, you know, I think having that sort of experience um, from anyone that's distributing the food uh, parcels will be quite important. But, um, Mace, if you can keep an eye on that um, and not only, I think, um, talk to Angela, but come back to us with an explanation as to what we're transitioning into, I think we're all concerned about that. Thank you, Your Worship. And I just had one, one comment for Phil, um, and this is just around uh, the recovery and the opportunity. You've spoken about the leadership of the, um, the civic leadership, but I, I think that if, we, if we're role modelling, I mean, things should be changing. As the toilets are opening, there should be a physical, a, vis a visible change to be able to say this, this is not this is not the normal we had, this is the new normal, and what does that look like? So as we're doing, and I know there's no money, but maybe there's some different signage, there's a different physical appearance, our people are still cleaning the buses, still cleaning the trains, so while we're all modelling that behaviour, then people who are coming back into uh, the workforce and schools and back into public can see that it's different now. That's just a comment. Yeah, Phil's given the thumbs up to that comment. Uh, he's he's in agreement with it, and I, I I think we do. the 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 normal will not will be a new normal, not the old normal, and that's absolutely uh, critical. Uh, Linda Cooper. Thank you. I mean, same around the food banks, etc. I guess for me, it's about we can't sustain that vector, and in the end, it'll be about how we support the major. Um, organisations who are doing this in our own, you know, compass points of our region. I think that's really critical. And I mean, a lot of it has been volunteered food um, from supermarkets, etc. cetera, um, whether they can sustain that or not, and also Ministry of Social Development. So I guess we'll just need to be very aware and see how we can support or not. I mean, our major job isn't to provide food as a council, but definitely to support organisations where we can, given the budget we have. Um, just want to go back to this whole notion around now Level 3 and I think the very confusing message the governor, government has given about staying within your region. And as we know, we've got a massive region and in Councillor Henderson and my ward, we've got some very popular West Coast beaches and um, 
Shane's worked really hard this last week to get some of those toilets open. So I know it's a really basic thing, but it's a basic thing that people expect councils to do. And we've got people going in their droves already, driving long distances to our West Coast beaches, and I'm sure other beaches in the area. And, and I just don't know how we manage that because the expectation from our community through Facebook, of course, which is always really hard to manage, is um, rather than emailing us directly, is people saying, if we don't open the toilets, people are going in the dunes and it's pretty bad. And so um, I guess for me is the question around, uh, first of all, I know this is really mundane. If you could just send the councillors and the local boards the list of the toilets that are open, those 140. So at least we can be able to tell people, yes, that's open, and then the reasons why the others aren't. And we've had some really good responses to that from through Mace and his staff. But um, I think that's simple messaging we can do to our communities who bear the brunt of people travelling within their region. Um, this just seems so crazy to say region. That the whole messaging is wrong and it's giving people leeway to get in their cars and drive, you know, 30, 40 k to go to the beach. So, yeah, anyway, I, we can't change that messaging because it's from the government. So I guess that's the thing for me is um, how our, our staff navigating that regional message with the confusing message, but stay local. Um, and also making sure that our people that live in those local communities don't have to deal basically with the excrement, you know, um, which is, is not okay for our environment. It's Thank not okay for health and safety. Thank, thanks, Linda. I'll, I'll get Ian to answer that to the extent that he's able to. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Councillor. Uh, I know um, Claudia and perhaps um, Rod Sheridan are on the line, but look, they're carefully trying to balance uh, the sorts of issues you've just highlighted and the opening of uh, toilets uh, along some of those um, West Coast beaches has, has been an example of that. So look, it's, it is an ongoing issue. The police are primarily uh, responsible for uh, behaviour and any sort of disorder or uh, around the requirements of, of, of social distancing and so forth. But look, we're working uh, with local communities and with the police around opening up facilities such as toilets. Um, and I know there are mixed messages out there. And if I can, I'm sure we'll be able to provide a schedule of toilets out um, to, yeah. to, to those councillors. Yeah. Absolutely, we'll be that. working on that today. Thank yep. you. Thank, thank you very much for that. Thank you, and um, thanks for all the work. Elf, you had a quick comment you want to make about food parcels. Councillor Filipina, uh, have we got I'm you on the line there? Yep. Yeah. yeah, look, I, 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 I did. And look, I, I, I think for me and um, the accountability for uh, the money, I, I just wanted to congratulate uh, the 0800 number set up. Um, and, and that's because I know with with what we've received is that we can make, well not make, but we can account for the parcels and all the assistance that we have. Other organisations don't have that. Um, so in regards to it, this is why it's important uh, when we get to level two, level one, or whatever level where um, it, it may not be needed. I think the 0800 number will be needed. Um, and, and, you know, from, from my perspective and getting uh, feedback from the community um, since we started the 0800 number, it, it, it is definitely going to be uh, something that we need to continue um, maybe a few months after this. But the accountability is the one. Um, and I mean, my partner works at, at uh, Work and Income, and, and it's interesting that, that people um, that she's heard where they double dip, triple dip, they, they travel around to the food banks, but at least I know from with our 0800 number where they've gone, what we've given. So look, just, just want to acknowledge all the work that's been done. So thank you, Your Worship. Yeah, thank you, Councillor, and I've made that point um, uh, on your behalf and on mine to um, to, to Minister Cipollone. Um to, to to Linda Cooper's point. Yeah, transition's always harder than steady state. Steady state, you know exactly where you are. Transition's pretty hard, so um, we we do need to have continuing messaging, and I'm sure the government will be uh, aware of that. Uh, Councillor Pippa Coombe. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and kia ora koutou, Mace, Ian and Phil. Thank you for your update. I really do appreciate what you present to us each week and the, the range of issues that are being covered. Uh, my mum was one of the over 70s who received a phone call, which was um, she very much appreciated. Um, just in terms of, um, so this is a comment and a question regarding the work that Auckland Transport and ADO have very quickly moved to create extra space um, for walking and cycling so that we can maintain social distances during level three. And it's really fantastic to see this being rolled out really speedily now. Um, in terms of a comment about that and picking up what um, Councillor Fletcher um, point, um, I think what has happened is because it has been done very quickly on Ponsonby Road, the intention was very much that no car parks are intended to be removed, and that's the design that myself and the local board have supported, and so it's going to be re-looked at today because um, it's possible to have the extra space as well as maintaining a traffic lane and a parking lane but there was a bit of a breakdown in communication with the contractor who put down the cone, so I know that that's already underway. Um, but I just wondered in terms of the emergency management response, just the question I have is, I, I know, Mace, you mentioned that there was going to be some 30K implementation, and I just didn't quite catch the coverage of that. Um, so I'm just keen to know that, and also just how much you're across um, the work that Auckland Transport is doing and I, in identifying locations where additional space would be useful because I know across the region local boards are getting quite excited that, at this opportunity for um, putting in emergency measures that can be done very quickly. They might not always be really attractive, but this is a really good way of, of just um, using the materials that we've got in a really ch cheap, quick way to provide extra space. And we're just seeing that we do need on our, in our town centres and in popular recreational locations, it's really important to, to provide the space that people are getting used to while they've been in level four and, and spending more time um, using the, the road for, for being able to create that space, which is now not available anymore as the cars return. Thanks, Papa. We'll get a comment so from Mace on that, perhaps. Thank you. Um, just a quick comment, um, Councillor Cooman, thanks for the question. So the, typically the spaces that Auckland Transport have been looking at is um, those areas around interchanges, uh, schools, uh, the community-based assessment centres for testing, uh, COVID-19 testing. Uh, hospitals and uh, the fast food outlets, and you've mentioned, of course, those other initiatives um, such as Ponsonby Road, where there's been a greater level of um, provision for uh, for pedestrian pedestrian use. But we are in contact with ATOC quite often to get an update on on what's occurring. Thank you, Mace. Uh, Fisso Collins. Sorry, guys, I, my thing wouldn't come off. No, I'm, I'm really glad, and thanks. I'm, I was just keen to get the list uh, of toilets because people may have seen the article that's going around in social media around the a couple of gentlemen who went into Imangere Budgeting Centre to ask for adult nappies because they weren't sure where toilets were overnight or feeling safe. So it would be good to get that list through. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Afeso. Uh, Councillor Casey. Hi, Miss. Um, oh, it's not it's Ian, sorry. Ian, I've got a couple of questions. You've got both on the about... line. Oh, right. Hi, Mace. <laughs> I've got a couple of questions. My first is about libraries. I think that libraries can play a major part in our recovery. And my question to you is, have we, or are we considering a click and collect service where the doors stay closed, but we can still actually issue books? I think Cloudy is probably best to answer that, but I think the answer is yes. But... Good. Claudia, are you on the line? Do you have any comment to make on that? Kia ora koutou. Um, my apologies, Councillor Casey. Would you be able to repeat the question? 
Yeah, just to find out if we are considering a click and collect service so that we can open the libraries early, provide a service but not have the doors open per se. We are currently reviewing that process right now and we're hoping to have some more information and discussion and finalisation of that idea tomorrow. So Brilliant. we're hoping to be able to provide some additional information soon. That's fantastic. Look forward to hearing the heart rending to, to hear. And I know that there's lots of people in that position that are that are our staff, but my plea is this can workforce planning be part of the COVID briefings to us so that we actually know what's going on because I really don't. I had no words to say back because I don't know. And I wondered if they can be in a confidential forum. I mean, I'm very happy. I just need to kind of uh, have some words to give back to people, to, to reassure them. I, I have no words of reassurance at the moment. Maybe you don't either. Yeah, so uh, who, who would like to answer that? I think... Uh... It's um, Dan Maxwell. It's probably not a, a solid answer. Look, it, th these are issues which we are working through. So the council and you as governors uh, will need to look at what our financial uh, situation is and how best to respond to that. And that's, I know, for example, later today there's um, a workshop uh, around uh, some of those financial issues, but we are working on uh, what the situation looks like, sort of scenarios and some choices and options um, for you to consider. But it is a it is a serious issue that we face as a result of the the COVID nineteen um, reduction in revenue that we face. And just one final question, then, Ian, since you chose to answer, how are we keeping in in, in touch with those staff, and I don't mean the staff that are directly employed by us, I mean the staff who are currently on 80% of their wages who are subcontracted to us. They are once removed. How are we keeping in touch with them with regard to their future? At the moment, I would think um, uh, we're not in touch with them individually. We'll be in touch with the, uh, the business as a whole, but we're not in touch with the staff members of uh, firms f um, th that we contract with. We're dealing with, um, we're dealing with uh, the owners uh, primarily. Thank you very much. Uh, Josephine Bartley. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to give my thanks to Mace, Phil and Ian for their ongoing work in this area. My, I share the same, same concerns regarding food, uh, but I've also had uh, discussions because here in my community I'm part of two food banks and um, the issue there has been uh, you know, how can council support community to continue providing the food parcels? And it has been good to have our own distribution because of the volume, uh, but when we do transition out of this as council, how are we going to be supporting the local community groups to continue doing this at a bigger level? Uh, because they'll pick up the, the calls that keep coming. And uh, yeah, and then I also still have, con I'm still confused about Auckland Transport and the physical distancing changes they're putting in place. And if they can start working with us as councillors and the local boards about the changes that they're putting in place. Um, I know that they did it with Waitemata, but they haven't done it anywhere else where they've put in the changes that I, that I know of. Uh, so it would be really good to see some clarity around that Julianne Genta uncapped fund for emergency response and how we as uh, local representatives have our part in what comes out of those, those uh, funds and actions. May, may, may be uh, questions to you again. Um, obviously you've made the point that we're, we're looking at transitioning in the food bank area and you'll come back to us on that. Um, in terms of the um, <clears throat> Auckland Transport, I don't know whether you can comment much further. Um, they've, they've put in place 17 different projects for physical separation and uh, allowing for more walking and cycling. Uh, is there anything further that you can add to that? They also, uh, Josephine, have um, they're looking to make um, further bids under Julianne Genta's expanded um, scheme that will not involve a cap of seven million, but we'll be looking at, uh, at wider um, at wider funding for that. Uh, and they're, they're, they're processing, I think, uh, uh, ideas for, for moving forward on that. But Mace, have you got any further information? Uh, no further information, Your Worship, or Councillor Bartley on 
other than what you've shared, um, Your Worship. Um, uh, we, yeah, in terms of the food banks, um, I, I acknowledge that that's a significant piece of work we need to come back to on the transition. So. Yeah, I think it would be a good idea, actually, if we, we might get uh, Auckland Transport in next week uh, as part of the team just to give us an update. But, Megan, you might be able to add further to that in the meantime. Thanks, Mr Mayor, and, um, and thank you, Councillor Bartley. Look, just to say that there is going to be a report next week um, around the initial bid for, the, uh, for that Accessible Streets Fund, um, or Innovating Streets Fund, and there will be some further work and process over the next month or so about how um, you as elected members, both local board and councillors, can get involved um, in that process. So we'll speak to you about that next week. Okay, hopefully that will help uh, you know, a number of us that uh, would like to get an update and to work out how the two funds uh, uh, seem to be working together. Uh, so um, we can look forward to that next, uh, next Thursday. Um, and last on the list, uh, Deputy Mayor Cashmore. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and uh, thank you to all our staff, um, ELT, right through librarians, everybody who's been putting their shoulder to the wheel on this, this crisis, and it's great to hear. My question's to Ian, it's a very simple one, Ian. Looking into the future, um, what do you see as our ability to continue doing the work we are doing, or even as some councillors are asking for, for our work to be ramped up even further? Um, when are you going to be landing some um, medium, longer term plans about the financials and the actual pragmatics of doing extension of these um, programs? Well, thank you for that question. It's, um, I think there's probably two, at least two stages to this. There's an immediate issue, and it's around um, the sort of revenue um, reductions that we're facing and how we respond to that. And it, look, it's, it's complicated, as you're aware. It's linked to debt levels and, and whether central government plays a role in perhaps mitigating some of the reductions. But I think there's that initial sort of phase. And then there's um, how we undertake things in a, in a longer term, and I think that's probably decision-making, particularly targeting the annual plan. But it's, um, look, there's no doubt every crisis brings some opportunities to do things differently, but we do face some significant um, revenue issues in the short term. Thank you. Uh, Bill, do you have any further supplementary on that? No, that's fine, thanks. Um, just we've got to be, be careful of what we can promise compared to what we can deliver. Just yeah, no, we're, we're, we're caught in that awful trap of um, having greater demand for uh, services from council because of the difficulties people are in uh, and sharply reduced revenue uh, with a few people out on the edges also asking us to further reduce our revenue. So uh, those, are the, those are the issues that we have to deal with. Um, look, uh, councillors and uh, IMSB members, thank you very much for that. that. That's an hour and a half, but I think it's worthwhile making sure that we all have the chance to comment and, and ask questions about the big issue that's, uh, that's, that's still dominating the city and the country. So I'd like to move that we receive the report and thank uh, Ian, Phil and Mace uh, for the briefing. Pippa uh, has uh, Pippa Coombe to second. All those in favour, please say aye. To the aye, contrary, aye. aye. To the contrary, no, uh, carried. We come now to item number nine on the agenda, which is the MOTAT annual plan. And I just want to check that I've got uh, Ed uh, Sidil and Alistair Cameron on the line. Ed and Alistair, are you there? Yes, I'm here, Mr Mayor. So Ed's there. Uh, Alistair? No, I'm here, Mr Mayor. That's great. Um, and I'll ask, um, I'll ask Desley Simpson to, uh, to move this and maybe uh, Councillor uh, Henderson to second it. Um, because I think uh, you've been dealing with this under finance and performance. Um, uh, Ed, uh, would you like to give an outline first, and then, then I'd ask maybe Pippa to, uh, to speak to it, uh, uh, Pippa, um, <laughs> Councillor Simpson to speak to it and, uh, uh, and ask any questions? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, good morning, Mr. Mayor and Councillors. Um, look, I'll introduce it, but we also have uh, Marina Red from RFA on the line to answer any more detailed questions about the MOTAC plan. Um, and Marie can probably also respond to the earlier question from Councillor Newman about um, the reopening of regional institutions. Um, look, Council funds MOTAC through an annual levy under the provision of the MOTAC Act, and we were, we were, as the Mayor said, originally going to bring this advice to you in March to finance and performance, but obviously the uh, COVID situation um, hit us all at that time and delayed things. 
um, RFA as our agent in the process discussed uh, the process with us and we uh, wrote to MOTAT in early April, or rather RFA wrote to MOTAT in early April requesting a revised plan and we will request MOTAT uh, worked really quickly to turn around a revised plan um, in conjunction with RFA. And while the strategic priorities remain largely the same, MOTAT has um, frozen staff salaries and deferred some capital projects um, and thereby reduced its levy, re levy request by 5.8% uh, on last year and considerably on what it originally was coming to council for. Uh, this can be seen on page 41 of the plan. I'm sorry, I don't know which page of the uh, agenda that's on, but it's uh, 41 of MOTAC's plan. Uh, where the indicative budget is, and you can see there how MOTAC uh, has set out quite transparently its various business service areas and development projects and showing those deferred works. Uh, MOTAC, uh, sorry, RFA has recommended that MOTAC's plan and letter be approved and uh, their letter uh, advising that to council is attached to the report. Um, I'd also just like to uh, take the opportunity to acknowledge um, MOTAC's leadership during the COVID crisis. Um, they've been really active um, in the cultural heritage sector, not only in Auckland, but more broadly around New Zealand. Um, MOTAC provi uh, prepared a, a table in, um, of responses at different alert levels and what it meant for them and how they would operate. And they shared that range of institutions were able to use it as a, a resource for guiding their own responses, and that was, has been really well received. Um, also, the report notes that MOTAC um, very quickly swung into action and put up some resources on its um, MOTAC.fun website uh, for parents, children and teachers to use at home. And um, there's a link in the report that hopefully is working if you're all looking at the report online that you can click through to see what MOTAC's been doing. Um, just responding quickly to what Councillor Newman asked, MOTAC's indicated to me by text while the meeting was going on that Staff are all, of course, working at home in their bubbles at the. I'm sorry, Ed, you're breaking up a little bit there. Can you just repeat what your last sentence was? Hopefully, you're back online again. Okay, we we seem to have lost Ed at the moment, um, which might be a good opportunity um, for me to pass over to Councillor Desley Simpson for comments, and I just want to back up what Ed has said and no doubt Desley will say about the constructive uh, role and the leadership and the responsibility shown by MOTAT. Um, they, they haven't been dragged kicking and screaming into this. Uh, they've they've recognised the problem, they're playing their part and the savings that they're delivering up today I think is over $2.1 million. Uh, that's about 1% of the minimum level of $250 million we've got to find, but every, every bit helps and they have been in, uh, incredibly responsible in their attitude. But Councillor Simpson, would you like to speak to uh, the, the resolutions? Look, I'm very happy to. I think a lot of it said. This is one of those things, colleagues, that um, we have to approve. Uh, MOTAT um, voluntarily have done this, and I want to acknowledge MOTAT um, staff and the board hugely in the way that they have acknowledged that we have a bit of a, a lot of a problem, and their their role in helping with us um, deal with that. I think that just the clear point that they originally were going on for an 8% increase on last year and they have actually come in on a 5.8% decrease on last year. So they haven't even held at last year, they've actually gone below that. And I just think that we all um, owe them a huge uh, acknowledgement uh, for the work that they've done to help us in this tough time. Thank you. Th thank you very much, Councillor, and uh, that's absolutely correct. It's, um, it's a, a big gesture on their part, and I hope uh, an inspiration to other organisations that we're working with uh, to find those savings. Um, uh, uh, Shane Henderson, would you like to add to those comments as Deputy Chair of, uh, of the Finance and Performance Committee? Yeah, I just want to kind of echo and endorse those comments, um, and yours as well, Mr Mayor. I do hope that it is an inspiration. Um, but yeah, certainly a sacrifice for MOTAT 
for the greater good of the city, and I think that's a really, really laudable thing. So thank you to Motat. I do have some questions on the report, but maybe I'll handle it through the email. Um, but yeah, apart from that, I'd also want to say thanks to uh, Desley Simpson as well for your hard work on this. Uh, thank you. Yeah, big thank you to both of you. Um, look, rather than going through the roll call and rather than having uh, comments and questions separated, I'll just ask uh, people please to to indicate uh, um, either on the the talk line or or um, call out if they'd, if they'd like to ask a question or to make a comment. So comments and questions from any member or councillor on the on the call. It's pretty straightforward, I think. Yes, um, uh, it's Pippa, if I may, just as yep, Pippa Coon. Um, Motat being in my ward, so obviously um, very proud of it as an institution and acknowledge just the work of um, Michael and the whole Motat team. But um, this is more of a comment in terms of, I mean, it's fantastic how they have responded and appreciate the work that's gone into bringing forward the revised plan. Um, one element of it that is noted is that Motat are going to be able to go ahead with the car park and the walkway greenway that's proposed, which is a collaboration with the Waitamata Local Board. And I just think it highlights where we can leverage funding to make projects happen because the board has is contributing a significant amount and also it's unlocking a legacy parking fund that goes back to the old Auckland City Council days. Um, so with MOTAT able to progress and having funding to progress, it actually unlocks two different other pots of funding. And I'm presuming it's not clear um, that that funding has been secured, so I'm just presuming that that has all been given the go-ahead by finance that the particularly, and particularly the parking fund can still be unlocked and used for that project. Thank, thank you, Pippa. I'll just check um, whether Ed's back on the line to see if he wants to comment on that. Um, I am here, Mr Mayor, but I think that might be um, one. If Marie, if you're there, um, you might want to comment on from RFA. You've worked with Motor on that. Uh, thank you for that, Ed, and good morning, councillors. So, um, Papa, I have followed up with the local board team and confirmed that that funding would still be needed for MOTAT to complete the car park, uh, and I'll follow up with them again on that as well. Well, and thank you, Marie, and also the, do you know about the parking fund, if that's still secure, that budget? Yes, there's, so there's funding coming from two separate funds. One we've already secured by way of a funding agreement, and the other we're just um, confirming that it is still coming through. Thank you very much. Are Thank there any, any other questions or comments from councillors? A question from me, Phil. Yep, yep uh, Councillor Council Walker. Walker. Sure, I can, I can appreciate the requirement to bring a budget forward quickly, and, and obviously the reduction that MOTAD has made is um, commendable. Having said that, given the circumstance where things aren't entirely predictable and aren't going to be over the next financial year. Does the, does the budget um, allow flexibility so that if changes need to be made over the course of the year, priorities change and, and the like, that that is allowed for? Uh, Ed, you might have an answer to that. Uh, yes, I think the budget does allow for that. I mean, largely the, the way that um, the reduction has been achieved is by deferring a couple of capital projects and freezing staff salaries. So there's still considerable um, ability there within the operational um, envelope to um, change things as priorities shift and perhaps, you know, the situation shifts with COVID. So, uh, yes, I think there is that flexibility. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Al Filipina. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Look, I, I, I also wanted just to congratulate uh, MOTAT for, for, for where we are now, but I think what can't be understated is, is the work that uh, RFA did during this process as well. So I just want to acknowledge the work that RFA did uh, in, in regards to getting um, MOTAT in, in the position we find ourselves, uh, Your Worship. So I just want to acknowledge uh, the work there. 
Thank, thank you very much, uh, Councillor. Much appreciated. Uh, if there's no further comment or question, um, it's been moved by uh, Desley Simpson, seconded by Shane Henderson. And just noting that not only is the saving set out in the approved levy, but acknowledging the role of MOTAT and also taking on, uh, on board, of course, uh, uh, Councillor Philippina's comments. So I'll put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. Carried. Thank you very much for that. Um, I will, uh, councillors and IMSB members, I'll, I'll assume on some of these issues that there is a, a broad consensus and support for it, but if you want a division called, uh, please feel free to do so. Uh, we come to item number 10 uh, on the agenda, which is the uh, council's submission on draft government policy. Uh, the, the draft government policy statement on land transport and also the draft national rail plan. Um, sorry, I, now I just had a complaint that people couldn't hear. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so um, I'll ask uh, uh, Councillor um, Chris Darby to move and Councillor Josephine Bartley to second it. This is normally a, a planning uh, committee uh, uh, subject and I'll ask them also to speak first on it after we've heard from our officers. Let me just double check uh, that we have uh, our officers on the line. Do I have uh, Jim Fraser and Ryan Falconer on the line, please? Uh, yes, Your Worship, Jim Fraser here. Okay. So can... Um, uh, it's been moved by, by Councillor Darby, seconded by Councillor uh, Bartley, and if I can ask you to speak to it, please, Jim. Yes, yeah, you will, Chef. Um, I've got a presentation um, which I'm having difficulty loading. The committee secretary might be able to assist in by putting it up. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'm just going to do a quick presentation on uh, around the GPS. Uh, my colleague Ryan Falconer will present on the um, very national uh, rail plan. Um, quickly going through it. Um, can we flick to the next page, please. Um, just giving an overview of uh, what the GPS is, the, the, the key directions that are outlined in the G GPS, and the funding allocations um, also. Remain the priorities of GPS 2018. Um, safety remains a priority with the wording updated to reflect the road to zero strategy. Um, access remains a priority, but is now covered by two parts to provide clearer guidance and with GPS 2021 continue to, continues to support better transport travel options and um, well connected uh, freight routes is the other priority area. The environment remains a priority with a focus on investment that aligns with government's greenhouse gas reduction targets. Next page, please. To achieve these priorities, GPS 2001 allocates funding to focus investment on implementing the road to zero interventions through a specific road to zero activity class amounting to around $10 billion over 10 years, including around 
1.2 billion additional investment in local roads. Implementing freight and some interregional rail network investments defined in the draft New Zealand rail plan through a specific rail network activity class. Uh, implementing the Metropolitan Rail Network Investment defined in the draft National Rail Plan and approved under the previous Transition Rail Activity Class through a Public Transport Infrastructure Activity Class. Public transport in cities and expand, expanding the public transport system to support new housing and interregional community commuting with over one billion per year allocated to public transport through a specific public transport activity class, services activity class. Next page, please. To achieve, sorry, a bit of fun. The, uh, to achieve these priorities is also um, shaping land use and urban form and street design in a way that reduces car dependency, making walking, cycling and micro mobility safe and attractive travel choices around $1 billion allocated for walking and cycling. Uh, implementing mode shift plans to shape urban form, make shared and active modes more attractive and influencing travel demand in transport choices. Um, improving mode choices for um, moving freight by coastal shipping through a specific coastal shipping activity class. And finally, a transition to a low carbon transport system through reducing transport demand and interconnected infrastructure, encouraging walking, cycling and the use of public transport and the use of rail and coastal shipping for moving freight. The GPS also has dedicated funding for delivering on government commitments. The activity class classes include sufficient funding to cover the central government share for government's commitments to the Auckland Transport Alignment Project, uh, Let's Go Wellington Moving, the Road to Zero, and to the New Zealand Rail Plan. The Crown funding of $6.8 billion, billion to progress new infrastructure projects. The New Zealand Upgrade Program builds on investments through the fund. This is not included in the activity classes, so it brings the total overall investment in land transport system to around $54 billion over the next 10 years. Next slide, please. Recommendations. The, uh, it's recommended our submission uh, should it's, uh, it's largely supportive of the GPS. Um, it supports the GPS as strategic direction and investment priority given to safety, better travel options, improving freight connections and climate change. These investment priorities are generally well aligned with the Council's priorities identified in the Auckland Plan 2015. It requests, however, that greater clarity around the climate change priority is needs to be reflected in transport systems investment and how the better travel options priority is to be delivered. It is not clear how reducing gas, greenhouse gas emissions will be achieved through actions across all priorities, programs and activity classes. In the absence of a dedicated pool of funding, more clarity and direction is required as to how emissions reductions will drive investment decisions across activity class. It's also not clear how the better travel options priority is to be delivered, how implementing the Auckland mode shift plan is to be funded, how will uh, Waka Kotai prioritise investments that support compact urban forms, as this is the most effective means of promoting mode shift. Submission supports the increase Funding allocation for road safety through the new Vision Zero class 
an additional 1.2 billion investment in local road safety improvements and $3 billion in state highway safety improvements. It supports the dedicated funding from the National Land Transport Fund for rail network maintenance and renewal as part of the integration of rail network planning and land transport system. Next page, please. Our submission supports the government's confirmation that it will fund the Auckland Transport Alignment Project. It supports the neutral, mode neutral approach to transport planning investment decisions. It supports the suggested approach to better integrate land use and transport outcomes, but requests greater clarity around how Auckland's quality compact growth strategy will be enabled. Uh, they suggested a range of uh, minor, road, uh, minor word changes as well. Next papers. Any questions? Thank you. Okay, before we take questions, I think we'll run through uh, Ryan's um, presentation as well, and then we'll deal with the two together. So, are you there, Ryan? Sorry, Ryan, are you with us? I can't hear anything from you. We might have lost uh, uh, Ryan uh, from the call. Um, if I can't pick him up now, I might just move back to ask. Um, we'll, we'll, run, we'll run questions and comments. Uh, okay, Ryan's going to try and dial in. So while he's dialing in, um, what I'm going to suggest is if I can ask uh, Councillor Christabi uh, and uh, Councillor Josephine Bartley if they uh, would like to open up the questions and comments. We'll run the two together, and if you could, um, if you could um, put on the comment line if you'd like to. Um, comment or, or, or ask a question on this topic uh, while, while Chris uh, and Josephine uh, are speaking to it. Um, while we're waiting for Ryan, uh, Chris, I might just ask you to make some introductory comments and uh, if you've got any questions. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, look, I've added your name to the delegation to sign this off because my feeling is, Mayor, that there might be a little bit more than just edits here. And I appreciate the work that Jim has been doing on this. Um, but I think there might be some gaps that will come out of our conversation here today, uh, which um, I think you, you need some oversight of as well. Um, probably just let's just uh, sit with questions at the moment. And Jim, thanks for your outline here. Um, at the very top of this document, it talks about the GPS um, or the transport system improving people's well-being and livability of places. But as you proceed into the document, sorry, this, if somebody could turn yeah. the mic off there. Yeah, could, could everybody please make sure when they're not speaking, have their mic off because we're getting some extraneous sound through. Uh, Councillor Darby? Thanks, Mayor. As you move into the document, it seems to lose sight of the livability of places emphasis. And I think you've, you have given some emphasis to that in part. We all know that transport and land use are, are linked like with an umbilical cord. But this document still introduces that concept, um, but doesn't really hold it. And um, so my first question to you, Jim, in your consideration of our submission, do you think we adequately give weight to what I see as some weak linkages to land use here? First question. Jim, would you like to comment on that? Uh, I'll, I'll get Councillor Darby to ask his questions and then I'll come back to Ryan Falconer, um, who's on the line now. Uh, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. That's good. Thanks, Jim. Probably go first. Yeah, I, I do think we probably we haven't um, we haven't um, stressed that or really addressed that issue that you you just raised. Um, I suppose it's been focused on um, our our response has been that the certainly the priority areas that um, have been identified are ones that will significantly um, address or improve uh, well-being and livability. Um, 
So it, we, it probably does lose that link a little bit between actually it's how it achieves that, um, the, 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 those priorities. So, so yeah, um, we probably we probably could submit a little bit more on that. Okay, because when you look at under climate change, it's got the the, the primary outcome, but it doesn't consider you know high density mixed use transit oriented development as a primary outcome. It's like a co-benefit, it's a secondary outcome. Um, yeah. So look, if we can address that, I think um, you're you're addressing the climate change um, yeah. um, um, matters to be uh, further reinforced. One of the things that I noticed there was um, that climate change reductions, taking a, it says on page 22, taking account of climate change reduction targets, not giving effect to. And I think that's just an absolute out opportunity. Have you noticed that, the, the wording there? Sorry, Chris, what page is that? It's on page 22 of the GPS submission and it's under climate change, and it identifies the primary outcome. Um, yeah, environmental sustainability, is that the one? Yeah, it's under, um, you see, primary outcome 69, and then uh, on the fourth line it says, taking account of emissions reduction targets. Um, Taking account is a weak, a weak direction. Um, yeah. Giving effect to is instructive. Yeah, yeah, agree. So, Mayor, it's very, Mayor, it's difficult to go through this in a Skype meeting. Um, yeah. But there are some, there are some gaps here. I think um, you raised also some concern, uh, Jim, about how the outcomes, the climate change outcomes were going to be delivered. And the narrative doesn't really go into that. But yeah. when you go into, there is a section on the narrative, I think it's under funding. Um, it talks about the re emissions reduction plan informed by the Climate Change Commission. It seems to rely a lot on that. Yes. Yeah, I think that one, um, that hasn't been, this is relating to the um, targets and budgets, I think, which haven't been set yet. So I think it's, uh, and also just going back, reflecting on your comment about, in that paragraph about taking account of, I think it's taking, uh, it's it's a, it's about this, these proposed budgets and um, targets which haven't been released yet. Um, so I think that's, that's part of the issue. It's relying on something which is, um, you know, hasn't been set yet. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Look, um, uh, it's really hard to rewrite the report, uh, as Councillor Darby said on a, a Skype line. But um, sure. uh, what I'm going to do is is come back to Ryan Falcon and ask him to speak to the National Rail Plan submission, and then. Uh, just uh, again to invite any councillors that want to ask questions or have an input, I've got Shane Henderson uh, down, but if there's any other councillors that want to ask questions or make comments, uh, we'll take those after after Ryan's presentation. Uh, so Ryan, you're on the line with us, I think, uh, and uh, yes. if you want to take us through your your presentation, uh, you don't need to read the whole thing out. If you if you can just summarise um, each each uh, page as we go through it, that would be fine. And councillors will be able to read it on screen as well. Happy to. Uh, I presume I can be heard okay this time. You're being heard loud and clear. Excellent. Right, let's proceed. Uh, I do have half a dozen slides, but we can move that through those relatively quickly. It's worth bearing in mind that uh, the component of uh, the National Rail Plan, sorry, the component of our submission uh, for the National Rail Plan is included with the uh, submission for the GPS, the reason being the close linkage between the two and also uh, the fact that the formal advertising of both occurred simultaneously and the submission deadline is the same. So just ask to continue on the next slide. Thank you. Thank you. So in terms of headlines, uh, the focus of the National Rail Plan is very much on the uh, longer-term outlook for 
for rail in New Zealand. Uh, it's a non-statutory document, intended to be a non-statutory document, uh, and does establish strategic priorities for rail. I've provided some of the headlines uh, on that slide there. I, as the Mayor said, I won't run through all of them. However, uh, there will be recollection of our submission in February uh, pertinent to the Land Transport Rail Amendment Bill uh, that uh, AT, Auckland Transport, also submitted on, and we presented a summary of, of that submission to Select Committee also in February. Uh, the submission, the verbal submission, was well received, uh, and we're aware that that legislation remains, or the bill at least, remains in Select Committee at this time. We've been keeping an eye on that. Uh, critically, too, I'll point out that uh, there is significant reference in, in the draft National Rail Plan to ATAP for Auckland, which is, of course, critical. It's a matter we've been talking to the ministry, uh, ministry staff about for some months. So uh, there has been some uh, advice provided in the formation of this draft document, uh, which means uh, there's a reasonable level of support for a lot of the content, which we'll get to fairly shortly. Just move to the next slide. Uh, just try clicking the cursor there, if you don't mind. Thank you. So I've added that in there just to give a bit of a sense of where ATAP sits within the context of the uh, the draft National Rail Plan, the National Rail Plan there shown in the circle. Uh, the diagram there is from the draft itself, the intention being to show the relationship of the plan to other statutory documentation, uh, including the GPS, uh, our regional land transport plans, uh, and Wellington's, of course, and also the uh, Rail Network Investment Program, which uh, you may recollect from uh, the development of our submission pertinent to the Rail Bill, uh, that being a new statutory obligation uh, as part of legislative change, and that being the piece that talks about the investment priorities for the Rail Network uh, over the next three years with a 10-year outlook. So uh, the linkage then, as I've mentioned, is to ATAP at a strategic level being informative not only for regional land transport plans, but also development of the of the RNIP. So I'll move on. Thank you. Uh, Jim has actually run through a number of the key points uh, in terms of the relationship of the draft national rail plan to the draft GPS. Uh, critically, there's mention of key projects in the context of Auckland, uh, as well as Wellington, from a passenger rail network perspective. Notwithstanding, we're aware of funding commitments uh, that have been made by the government more recently uh, as part of the New Zealand upgrade package. And what we would expect to see is finalisation of this plan accounting for those changed circumstances. Next slide, please. Thank you. Jim's mentioned the division of activity classes. The uh, key point to make is that some of the investment we would expect to see ongoing in Auckland around uh, metropolitan passenger service and operations and the like are under different activity classes to the rail network activity class in the draft GPS 2021. Uh, the particular focus of the rail network activity class in the GPS is on uh, primarily freight operations and improvement of the network uh, to a state of good repair. Uh, it's not on providing for uh, metropolitan passenger rail services in the sense of operations and those sorts of things. Next slide, please. Thank you. So in the context of uh, our recommendations uh, for submission, uh, I'll point out that we have liaised with Auckland Transport in the development of our submission content uh, that was latterly last week and early this week uh, where we had conversation around the issues. Uh, there is good alignment between submissions as we, as we might expect a very sim similar submission points, and we understand that the uh, AT submission will go to board uh, on the 8th of, of May, the submission date being the 11th of May. Uh, so, again, uh, good consistency in terms of points made, and uh, critically, the uh, areas of support, particularly around the long-term outlook for rail planning and investment in New Zealand, that being a key thing, uh, that is being addressed not only through the rail plan, but through the proposed legislative change subject to the previous submission. Uh, the support for those two strategic priorities, one being freight, but also critically for Auckland Metropolitan Passenger Rail Services, and support, strong support, of course, for uh, ATAP as a guiding document for investment in Auckland's transport system. That includes, but not limited to rail. Uh, thank you. Next slide, and this will be the last one. 
So we have some recommendations and suggestions regarding minor wording changes, which are included in our draft submission, uh, but particularly around the references through the National Rail Plan document, the draft National Rail Plan document, to uh, the legislative reform that's proposed, and in particular the bill that we've submitted on. Uh, so we, we would seek to see updates accordingly to the plan before it's finalised, taking into account our strong position around things like full integration of rail with other forms of land transport, uh, rather than the partial integration option that's proposed in the bill. Uh, various other things, including preservation of the integrity of our network access agreements and those sorts of things. So those points uh, we would anticipate seeing also in Auckland Transport submission, certainly in drafting of our submissions, those are key points that, we've, uh, that we have shared. So that would be the uh, the main points I'd like to summarise. I'm happy to take questions. Uh, thank you very much, Ryan. That's pretty clear. Um, so we're looking at both reports together. And uh, just to give uh, Councillor Josephine Bartley uh, as the seconder, um, are there any comments or questions that you'd like to make at this point? Um, I think our submission is, is good, but I did... Um, thank you, um, Mia, for the opportunity. I did want to ask some questions around economic development in the GPS and uh, the better um, was it freight connections and whether we feel that there's enough in the GPS to explain or to uh, measure um, that outcome in terms of increased economic productivity being should it, that it should be one of the outcomes of that Freight connections bit. Any thoughts on that? Jim, that question to you. Can you hear me now? Yep, I can hear you now, Jim. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, certainly the um, priority around freight movement is 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 focused on um, achieving a you know economic development outcome. Um, the other. The other priority areas um, don't seem to be a bit more focused on um, achieving other types of outcomes with less, although they have code benefits. A lot of them have code benefits in terms of economic prosperity. So, um, yeah, I mean the focus is there. Um, it's just not set up as a as a as a priority area, I suppose economic development is not set up as a priority area. It's really the um, the other priority areas have, in most cases, um, economic development um, uh, benefits. But um, yeah, thank you, Jim. Uh, uh, Councillor Bartley, any further questions on that? Maybe it's something we can mention in our submission. Then, given you know the COVID economic recovery. Um, being a priority, and yeah, it's because there's a big, big focus on the walking and cycling, which is good. Yep. But um, you know, it's mentioned. Freight connections is mentioned, and well, it should be, should be an outcome, a strong outcome. Yeah, it's well, there is definitely an outcome. It's I suppose it's just not identified as a priority area for you know achieving. Um, yeah, it's not just identified as a priority area, but it is definitely identified as one of the outcomes, one of the outcomes of one of the priority area or of the other priority areas. Thank and you. Other, oh, sorry, sorry. If I could just yeah. add, only two local boards. Given that this is actually quite important, um, are we working with local board services to get more input from the rest of the boards by the 10th of May? Um, the local boards have been informed about the GPS. Um, we have received another one. I've just received one recently from, um, apologies, I can't remember who it was. Um, but we, 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 we are expecting to get some um, feedback from the other local boards as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I've had two councillors indicate a desire to ask questions or make comments. Um, Shane Henderson and Wayne Walker. Shane, uh, you're next. Uh, kia ora. Thanks, Mr. Mayor, and um, thanks to staff for working on these. Um, it's really good work. Look, I've got a, a question slash comment about where this sits with the Port Futures Study. Um, 
I'm, it's quite funny to think that something that was so huge and, and looming and important um, is something that doesn't really occupy our discussions much anymore. Um, but it, uh, just for the record, I've long wanted detail around how freight is supposed to move through uh, the western line um, and in great number and all through the night, uh, given that there are a lot of residents that live along that line and includes, including housing that has recently gone in in places next to places like Sunnyvale train station. Um, so where does the strategy actually fit with the Port Future study? Thanks, Councillor Ryan here. I can probably provide some comment. Uh, unsurprisingly, perhaps I did think that this might come up and. and Fair and reasonable question it is. So look, the situation is, of course, we uh, are unclear on the results of analysis, which we understand to be ongoing, pertinent to the study, the new study that has been commissioned by Treasury and the Ministry of Transport regarding port futures and port options. And at this time, we don't have information pertinent to uh, what, which particular port options have been, been developed uh, strategically and assessed, assessed strategically and then what the implications would be from an infrastructure perspective. So from my point of view for the draft national rail plan to put in any signposts regarding infrastructure requirements would be premature. However, what we have done uh, as part of our proposed submission is include some clarification sorry, recommend clarification around wording as the timing of the draft as it was uh, released informally in December of last year made reference to the, the port work done last year. And we've made it clear in our submission, we believe to continue with those references would be inappropriate given the new work underway. So the anticipation is that when this is finalized around July of this year, that there would be a stock take taken of work completed as part of ongoing port investigations and that prior to that time councillors would be and council staff would be made aware of the results of the work uh, the analytical work including transport impact assessment work that's been conducted but we understand too given current circumstances with the COVID crisis that uh, ministry staff attention is elsewhere and that um, maybe some of the original time frames discussed with uh, the governing body back, I believe it was January, uh, those might have been pushed out. We're just not clear on what those time frames are now. Thank you. That's great. Cheers. Yeah, thank you very much for that. I think we're all waiting to see uh, what comes out of the, the, the government analysis of the Working Party report. But uh, as you suggest, I think it's uh, been put on the back burner. Uh, while well, people are focused on COVID-19. Uh, Councillor Wayne Walker. Uh, sure. Uh, just got some issues. I don't know how we can reflect them in our um, submission. Um, as it goes to climate change, there are two aspects. There's mitigation, reducing emissions, and then adaptation. It looks like um, adaptation is under transport outcomes, under resilience and security. But it, it references the National Adaptation Plan that's yet to come. Okay, that hasn't been developed yet. It might be mid-year. It might be later on this year. The impact of that can conceivably be massive in respect of transport investment. And the related issue is, is around just the 10-year duration of, of the planning, which is not adequate when it comes to both mitigation and also adaptation, particularly because significant parts of the roading network and the rail network are very close to sea level. So I just want to put that on the, on the map. Resilience is a critical consideration. COVID has hit us there. Climate change is coming. So just invite your comment there. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Jim, uh, Jim or Ryan, either, either of you got comments on that? Um, yeah, resilience is throughout the document in terms of its emphasis on it, um, but it's it's not yeah it's not identified as a specific outcome, um, but definitely included throughout the document. Um, the I, I agree with your your comments, Councillor Walker, that um, the national adaptation plan, when that's actually released, it will have significant impacts in terms of 
being able to, or in terms of perhaps diverting investment to uh, address those um, issues. And then the other comment that concerns me, and again this goes to rail and the relationship between rail and the transport document, there's mention of full integration of um, rail. Uh, a, a particular concern that I've got is the um, the ongoing move not to progress um, heavy rail to the um, to the airport when that could well have a much better business case and be far more resilient um, and and add resilience to the uh, network. And I'd invite a comment there. Thanks, Councillor Ryan. Here, I could. I'm happy to provide a couple of comments and also just step back and supplement a little bit of what Jim said regarding climate change and resilience. So there is a significant amount of work ongoing, of course, in this space broadly, uh, not just within council, but obviously with other agencies for any matter of different reasons, uh, everything from the adaptation side uh, based on the assets of, of individual agencies right through to, of course, the mitigation side and the need to work to establish processes such as ATAP, uh, of which, of course, there's an update proposed to do that, uh, and we're involved as council staff helping lead some of the climate change pieces to that. Uh, one thing I would say is that I believe nationally we lack at the moment a clear and certainly uh, universal and, um, and, and well-supported definition of what a climate lens really looks like when we're assessing something as complicated as our uh, national land transport system. But Rest assured, there's a lot of thinking and effort going into that right now. Uh, but yes, there is a matter of timing with this, given, for example, the Climate Change Commission's recommended uh, emissions budgets wouldn't be made, uh, uh, be publicised potentially later in the year in draft, but wouldn't come into effect till February 1, 2020. So yes, there's definitely a timing issue. With respect for uh, rail connections to the airport, um, not in a position to be able to comment on the current status of consideration of uh, options for uh, connection to the airport um, as, as to the process being run and also the time of, it, of any announcements. Uh, so unfortunately, I understand exactly the point you're making, but uh, the probably one distinction, sorry, that I would make further is that the National Rail Plan, much like the rail bill considered in February, focuses explicitly on heavy rail as opposed to light rail. Uh, so light rail would be something captured in other documentation, including but not limited to the GPS. Thank you. Uh, IMSB member Glenn Wilcox. Glenn, have we got you on the line? If I Yes, sorry. Yep. Sorry, sorry, Mayor. That's OK. A little while to get my, my stuff going. Um, my first question really relates to the Māori impact statement. Um, I suppose it's it's the it's the number 53, and the the statement that Māori are overrepresented in low income areas. I'm kind of I'm I'm kind of over this negativity coming from a deficit basis for Māori. And with regards to the to the submission, and I think this is this is the knuckle of my quarter law and Papai, and this is actually Māori we're right there at transport right from the beginning. The Native Land Act eighteen fifty two meant that five percent of all Maori land went to roading. The Y three one two claim was exactly about the North Auckland line and the, and the land that was given for that railway line by the tribes of Ngāti Whātua and others. So, I mean, I'm not seeing anything representing that in this draft. And I know we're, go, we're looking forward, but you can't go forward unless you make sure you have a platform on which to, to stand on. And I don't see anything there that says in this draft that recognition that Māori are part of the transport and the, the whole transport infrastructure, and they have been there from the beginning. So that's my first question. The second question is, 
I don't see anything from a climate change point of view with regards to electrification besides us doing the Pukekohe Papakura one because whether we upgrade rail or put a third line in or whatever, unless we're, unless we're going to electrification for, for the locomotive stock, we basically may as well be just keep using diesels and yeah, well where does that lead us? So those are the two questions. Thank you. Okay. Uh Jim or Ryan, I think, if you either of you want to comment on either aspect of those two questions. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for the question. Ryan, again, maybe just speaking to the second question, the one relating to rail. So the point regarding electrification, I acknowledge that it's in there as a future priority and is discussed as a particular case study. It's something actually that has come up in discussion at a staff level. So the, the question has come up regarding where work is, is sort of focused and the timeliness of, of some of these proposals, including a future priority as set like electrification outside of, of Auckland metropolitan network. Uh, there's also has been uh, over the last few months work done by the Ministry of Transport, uh, a green freight strategy, uh, a green freight paper which has been developed and that considered in part, but certainly not focused on um, freight operations from the perspective of rail. So what I would suggest, certainly from my perspective, uh, yes, it would be good to accelerate at least consideration, if not implementation, of lower carbon, uh, low, lower carbon intensity infrastructure like uh, electrified rail. Uh, from a ministry perspective, uh, from the discussions we've had, there's of course a focus in the first uh, the first ten years, certainly the first three, but definitely the first ten year outlook on improving the state of repair of the existing network, which is of course largely uh, for diesel operations, uh, with a view in time as well as technology matures to ascertain whether investment in something like electrification more widely is cost effective or an alternative fuel becomes more cost effective and that could be something like hydrogen. So that said, I'm not certainly not an expert on fuel applications and rail, uh, but there is a matter of timing that does come in here. Uh, but your, your point is certainly well made around decarbonising the broader network. And just to your first point, uh, Member Wilcox, Megan here, um, I'm really keen to understand um, and get your guidance, please, on how we could um, make it clearer um, in our submission uh, around uh, Māori involvement, but you know, I guess in past and in the future. So perhaps if I could start that offline with you uh, with an email and we can have a, a conversation as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Megan. Now I'm going to come to uh, the last question uh, comment I've got is from Pippa Coombe, and then I'm going to invite uh, Councillor Darby just to come back in. You'll see that we've made a small change in B, um, which is not just the minor editing change, but um, Councillor Darby, you had a, a desire to beef up the section on, on climate change and also livability. So if I can just get you to um, concisely summarise the sort of things that you're looking at putting in there uh, because we'll need the approval of, uh, of this meeting in order to, to do that. Sorry, I've got one other question coming after Pippa Coombe, uh, Daniel Newman. Uh, oh, Pippa? Kia ora, Your Worship, it's David. Uh, I'd also like to say okay. something in regards to B, if I may, when, when it's okay. good. Sure, and David Tyberry, I'll add to the list too. Good um, thank, thank you, Mr Mayor. More of a um, comment. I just uh, want to well, thank the team for the work on the submission and to acknowledge that really this is quite significant in terms of the first time that the GPS has been so aligned with Auckland's strategies and um, focus and particularly around road safety um, and the uh, transport funding priorities. So I think it is quite significant because it's very rare that we do have this alignment with central government. And so I'm very happy for the change that has been proposed just to ensure that we beef up the submission 
where we do have that language that we've already approved through our strategies and plans, and particularly giving effect to the climate change actions. And I think that, for example, in the summary, it doesn't actually say those words, but it's in the body of the submission. So that seems to be a, an important point that really needs to be emphasised. So I did, so just a comment in terms of the alignment that we've already got a lot of um, what's gone into the submission has been already approved through um, our planning and strategies and also just to um, support making that clear in the resolution that the delegated group can beef up the submission to ensure that we we get the language right. And that also picking up um, uh, Member Wilcox's points as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Councillor. I think it is worth emphasising that there is uh, quite good alignment between Council's position and the Government's position, and that it's good to see uh, again uh, set out very clearly that we will get the full amount under the A uh, Auckland Transport Alignment Project, the 16.3 billion uh, that was originally undertaken, but then came under questioning when there were budgetary problems in the NZTA. So both of those points are important. Uh, Councillor Daniel Newman. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Your Worship. I wasn't going to sp speak, but I, I can see I can see what's um, going on at B, and I'm a little uncomfortable with this. Um, I mean, when you have, I read the draft GPS, there are three ministers, um, and clearly this is a document that has been heavily influenced by Minister Twyford and Minister Jones. Um, so it is a focus um, on rail, particularly regional rail, uh, which is Minister Jones's priorities, um, and a focus on housing, which is Minister Twyford. I think that the uh, wording around taking account, which is set out in the GPS, it very clearly reflects where the government is going here. Um, and I don't think that it will entertain um, a stronger wording than that, particularly noting that this is a five month old document now, written prior to uh, a global pandemic, and that the changing economic landscape of COVID-19 means that it will be um, harder to move from aspiration to implementation, I think, in the first two years of the GPS when it comes to funding priorities. So the other thing uh, I think which is pertinent in relation to this document uh, is that uh, it is almost certainly going to be the case, and, and the document is written uh, noting the emerging role of, of, the, of the HUD, uh, and, and I would expect that uh, the government will be quite sympathetic uh, to future residential and suburban and greenfields development, um, which is going to require uh, complementary support and investment of the transport network. My concern for the officers actually isn't so much the wording in relation to um, the climate change strategic priority, it's actually in terms of the funding for the uh, uh, local transport network maintenance and renewals. So um, I, I think I know where, where B is going to go with this delegated group making changes to the submission. I don't think that's going to flow through to amendments to the GPS, however, but I do think that um, it would be helpful if we could understand exactly what the proposed funding lines in the GPS mean for um, the maintenance of the local road network, because that will be a, a challenge, uh, particularly for outer suburban communities as we continue to see future development, which will be supported by the government. Uh, thank you. Is uh, uh, any comment from from Ryan or Jim uh, on Councillor Newman's points? Uh, Councillor Newman, so Jim Fraser here. Um, yeah, in terms of your concern around the funding for local roading um, maintenance renewals, um, the GPS is does actually signal that there is a significant increase in funding in those areas. So. Um, in terms of the current funding ability, um, that, that, that there is actually going to be a lot more money directed in that direction. Um, the impact of 
COVID in terms of the revenue for, for funding is, 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 is uh, of course, a potential concern. Yeah, I think um, we're just in the spot. I, yeah, I accept that there is additional funding, but it doesn't necessarily get timed at the t um, at the point where the funding is needed. I mean that there are, there are networks that have been under strain for a long time, so the ability to ramp up funding to address that gap in a short time is constrained. And I think that the you know. I'd reiterate uh, the challenge around this document, which was of course prepared at a time when the when the call on the on the Crown's budget and and the sources of funding um, for the NLTF were um, obviously affected prior to. Sorry, Councillor, we've lost that last part of your comment. Um, yeah, uh, I think we also need to take into account that, of course, we've put yeah. into our, our shovel ready projects um, uh, in our one of the top 30 priorities is the, the renewal question. Um, have we got you back on the line, Daniel? Yeah, yeah. Look, I mean. I finish that. That would be good. Yeah, look, I, I, I guess it's probably, uh, I mean, I guess given COVID 19, it's probably best um, to let the government and, and to let the the funding streams that come into the LTF um, in LTF um, reflect the reality that that we are in a constrained environment. It's going to be difficult, and at least initially, to try and achieve some of these funding paths. Yep, that may well be. This is uh, just a reminder to everybody. This is a submission to the government on those areas, so it's something they take into account. Uh, but uh, it's not something that they they have to implement. They make the final decision, but it's important that we express our views. Um, just before we come back to um, Councillor Darby, uh, just to summarise the, the points that he wanted to change, uh, David Taipuri. Oh, Kia Your Worship. Uh, just quickly, is, uh, in terms of the Independent Māori Statutory Board member in B, I think it should be the Chair, particularly in the current state with the Emergency Committee being the fact that uh, I'm the most consistent member in the committee and bringing others in, so I'd just like to propose that. Uh, and secondly, uh, just to reiterate what uh, Member Wilcox was saying, uh, which is across the board really, uh, about the recognition of uh, uh, Māori uh, and the contributions they've made to infrastructure and economy, uh, and uh, particularly around uh, land being acquired, uh, various other things that have been done. Uh, so uh, again, just reiterating what uh, Member Wilcox said. Kia ora. Uh, Thank you, Member Taipuri. Um, yeah, look, with the approval of the mover and seconder, we can uh, make that more explicit that it's the chair of the IMSB. Um, do uh, Councillor Darby, Councillor Bartley, do you have any objection to that? Um, absolutely appropriate. Thank you. And no Councillor objection. Thank you very much. So, look, I'll just come back finally now to Councillor Chris Darby just to um, – I, I think – what I took, um, Councillor, from your earlier comments, you just wanted to beef up the climate change um, area and to emphasise the uh, placemaking livability aspect. But can you speak briefly to that so we've got an idea and you've got the approval of the committee to make those changes, uh, which may be more than the usual minor change? Thank you, Mayor. And look, just and very briefly, I think we canvassed it well, and no doubt this will, as government. COVID lens, um, and we'll see something different. But um, that that will be a, a, a challenge, a constraint, as somebody said. But it will also present opportunity. Not proposing any. I'm sorry, Chris. We're we're losing you again. Uh, we have this perennial problem. Um, yeah, we do. Can you start again? Uh, it's just 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 start again and let's see how we go. Hopefully, uh, if if need be, we can get you back by phone. But try again on Skype. Okay, um, I think we've we've lost Chris um, at this point. Um, but if I'm understanding it correctly. Uh, that what you'd like to do is um, just put a little bit more emphasis in terms of um, placement, uh, placemaking and livability, 
and uh, a little more emphasis in terms of climate change reduction. Uh, remembering this is a submission uh, and this is just putting views and ideas through to government. Um, have we got you? Have we got you back, Chris? I, I, I think we've lost you. Um, look, in the interest of time, I think um, unless there's any objection, we'll, we'll move to, um, to vote on that recommendation. Do you want to do that by division or by voice? Just, um, just a point of order, Mr. Mayor. Yep, yeah, yeah, Councillor Watson. Yeah, no, so, so I just want to be, this is rather unusual circumstances, uh, more ways than one here. So, so yep. essentially we've got the phrase here, the changes agreed at the meeting, you know, the state, the obvious, we, you know, we, 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 have, we haven't agreed, the vote will tell whether, whether we've agreed or not. But I'm assuming from what you're saying, and, you know, uh, um, that there'll be some uh, word changes, and, and, and the only changes I picked up from Councillor Darby's um, various contributions was the use of the, the phrase giving effect to in terms of um, climate change. And I didn't pick up any specific words that, that I can recall anyway in, in relation to, to um, you know, to, to, to livability or, or whatever those other um, adjectives used that, that were. So, so, so I, I guess just for the sake of clarity, I'm assuming that's the changes that we're voting on here that, that will be included. There won't be then some, um, you know, explanatory paragraph or, or, or um, increased detail other than, than what we've seen today. Yep, um, I'm, I'm making the same assumption. What I can ask um, Councillor Darby to do is just to uh, send uh, the proposed changes uh, around to uh, members of the governing body and the IMSB, um, but I'm presuming they don't go beyond what he talked about. Personally, I'm, I'm happy for a, um, a, a, a greater emphasis on climate change and equally just reference to uh, placemaking as, as, as part of what they need, need to take into account. It's not the normal way we would do this. Uh, I agree Am with I that. Am I with you now, Mayor? Okay, we've got Chris, ba uh, yeah, Councillor Darby back again. Um, I don't know whether you've been listening to this conversation, Councillor, but you might like to comment on it. Just came in on the back of Councillor Watson's contribution there. So, look, what I was saying before I had to reload Skype um, was I'm not suggesting anything which is inconsistent with our strategic directions and, and nothing that's inconsistent with what the officers that have drafted um, um, this report here today. So the officer emphasised that there needed to be a strengthening in the climate change area, and I highlighted uh, the words giving effect to rather than taking account of as an example. I leave the balance to the officers. The, the document will no doubt change uh, as government consider it through the climate, uh, the COVID lens. And the own, so in terms of livability, at the outset, I asked the question um, and the officers responded. At the outset, at, at the very front end of the document, it talks about um, the purpose of the transport system uh, contributing to improved livability of places. And I said that in the narrative, that is lost, that story is lost. And the, the officer responded, he said, yeah, uh, that could be improved. So I'm not writing those words. The officer said that that could be addressed and improved. So I'm just saying to the members here, do you want that improved or not? Because at the moment, the linkages to land use are weak. And Mayor, one other point, on the funding page of the document, the document itself, that's the draft GPS, there is reference to ATAP, but it, it, and it's good that it identifies, as you pointed out and saw, um, that it binds in ATAP, because it's a non-statutory document, um, but it only identifies the National Land Transport Fund quantum of 16.3, whereas ATAP identifies, um, you know, the 18 document, that is, I think at least 18 billion, um, and that's been improved because it takes into account the City Rail Link contribution and the Crown Infrastructure Partners um, uh, arrangements that we've made. So I'm just wondering if the officer might like to consider uh, making sure that the full funding 
of ATAP is identified rather than just the National Land Transport Fund. And then, of course, you've got the New Zealand Upgrade Program funding, which needs to be reflected as well. So that's my point. So I, I'm not going to write this prescriptively. It's not my job to be a, to prescribe this. It's my, my job to highlight some uh, um, points, uh, areas that need um, some polishing and leaving it with the staff to do that. And they are cognizant of the strategic directions that we've already set enough. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Councillor. So what I take from that comment, um, I, I, on the, there, there are two areas that you just wanted to give effect to more clearly, which was climate change and livability. Uh, I'm relaxed about the, the, the ATAP funding that I wanted uh, bound in was the $16.3 billion that was at one stage at risk of uh, bureaucrats in Wellington wanting to erode. So I'm, I'm the other, the other commitments, I think, are reasonably clear. Um, if there is some concern, I can treat the changes under B as an amendment, moved by Councillor Darby, seconded by Councillor Bartley, and we can vote on the amendment separately if there's a desire to do that. That might be the easiest way to resolve it, but just uh, if, if any councillor uh, has, has a preference, uh, to vote on that as an amendment, um, please let me know and we can put it in that way. Um, a question from Councillor Simpson. Uh, Your Worship, my only issue with B is I want to see what is actually written. I mean, I'm sorry that all this work wasn't done prior to today. Well, you've got a paper here that's supposed to be a planning that I would have thought the planning chair would have imported into already. I actually would just want to see what we're going to send. And if you're asking me to support B, a kind of they're not just minor. I'm hearing a list of things that uh, Councillor Darby has just sort of written is broken through. So I'm, a, I'm, not, I'm not, not wanting to support this, but I just want to see what's going to go. And I think um, um, it, it would have been better if all those changes had been done before it came here. So if you want to put an amendment up, fine, but I think from my, in my own heart I'm, I'm, I'm going to abstain because I haven't seen the final. And it's, too, it's not minor. It looks like a lot more than minor. Thank you. Yeah, look, I, I, un I appreciate your concern, uh, Councillor. This is not the way that we would normally have done it. Um, I don't think, however, we have the ability to, uh, but let me put it as a question to officers. When does this ha a submission, uh, Megan, maybe you've got an idea, when does the submission have to be in? Because it, it would be better. It would be better, sorry if I can finish, it would be better if councillors saw the specific changes uh, rather than voting uh, to, to make changes, uh, even though they've been outlined by Councillor Darby. Have we got an indication of when that submission has to be put in? 11th of May, so just a couple of weeks away. Not quite, oh, just two weeks. Okay, well, look, I, I, let, me, let me make this suggestion. Next week. Yeah, let me make that suggestion um, that we... We've had the discussion. We don't need to repeat the discussion. But in order to know the specific changes, that we bring it back to the emergency, we defer it for, for a week and bring it back to the committee with the, the changes clearly, uh, clearly spelt out. If we've got the time to do that, that's a preferable way of doing it in terms of people knowing precisely uh, what they, they uh, would be voting in favour of. Um, it, it may be that it's, it, it's, it, it's not controversial at all, but people want to vote on something that is clear rather than uh, not being precisely clear about the changes that might be made. So um, I, make, uh, I make that suggestion. So um, uh, maybe I can, I can move if somebody wants to second that we defer the paper for one week pending uh, the chair and deputy chair of the planning committee coming back Happy to second. with the, with the uh, Happy to uh, with the proposed changes. It's been uh, seconded by a number of people. Um, I. I heard uh, uh, Councillor Simpson, I think, there. Uh, so um, uh, I think that's the simplest way of dealing with it, Councillor Darby. So uh, I'll move that we defer it to Sorry, the just of point, of, point of order. Committee. Sorry, point of order, Mr Mayor. Yep, Councillor Koo. We also had the point that the um, IMSB members have asked us to include. So can it also go through um, uh, Chair there, Taipere as well? There's a discussion that was going to take place between Megan Tyler uh, and Glenn Wilcox just to incorporate uh, what Glenn was seeking in that regard. Yeah. 
Okay, so I think for, from both of those points of view, it's it's tidier if we we simply bring it back next week. We please next week don't relitigate the whole thing again. We've had uh, we've had probably an hour on this uh, conversation, but I think it's a tidier way to deal with it by bringing back the specific changes recommended. Uh, so I'll move accordingly. I've got a seconder. Uh, all those in favour, please say aye. 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 Uh, carried. Right. Um, you didn't we... say no. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, I said Did to the contrary. I couldn't yes. hear it. Sorry. Yes. No, I said all those in favour, please say aye to the contrary. No. And perhaps I didn't pause quite as long as I should have. No. No, I'm no. I would rather have this go through now. There's nothing wrong with it. Okay. Um, but I'll still declare it carried. Um, thank you very much. Now, look, we have um, two uh, items that are basically open process reports, uh, and then we uh, I'll put a motion uh, for uh, exclusion of the public. And at that point, I intend to call for a 10-minute break, um, unless people want a little bit longer for lunch. Can, um, okay, why don't so we call it? Mr Chair, I have to declare a conflict on this one and come out of the meeting, and yep. my understanding is 12 is not there, so if someone lets me know when Confidential comes back on again, I'll go out of the meeting okay. now. Um, okay, I think if you um, stay outside of the meeting, but just follow what we're doing, um, because it's, a, it's an open process report, so it won't create any conflict at that point. Uh, item 12 has been deferred at the request of Councillor Bartley, uh, so that further uh, discussion can take place with the local board. Uh, item number 11, the appointment of district, the district licensing committee, um, is uh, clearly for the purpose of, of making the appointment, I think, of 12 positions, if I, if I have it correctly. Um, and these include um, five, five commissioner chairpersons and seven members. Um, and what we're doing here is simply noting the information contained in this report and noting that the confidential report uh, will discuss the actual appointments, uh, which will need to be confidential uh, because of private information about the individuals until such time as the decision is made. Um, so perhaps, um, uh, uh, Councillor Newman, I think you were chair of the hearing panel. If you can move uh, the, the open um, process report and second it. Um, um, by, uh, if you've got a seconder there, and we'll Efeso. Efeso, uh and if, if there's no need for further comment or questioning no, at this point, we'll, we'll defer it to confidential. Are you happy with that? Uh, no, I'm not happy with that. Um, uh, firstly, I wasn't chairing that. I was I was chairing the hearings panel for the. Oh, sorry, you, you, sorry, yeah, I'm confusing that with the food safety. My apologies. Also, um, Mr. Chair, I, Mr. Chair, I do need to declare um, that I will have a conflict when we address this matter in the C1 Confidential, so I won't be participating in that given another role that I have. Um, so um, I can't help you. Okay, um, no, that's fine. Uh, Sorry, I'm, I'm, my, my Hi, mistake. Kevin. Still happy to move, Chair. <laughs> okay. Efeso moving and... Uh, I can maybe... second that because I chaired the panel um, Councillor Bartley. Councillor Bartley to second, I so I'll put... As well, but that's fine. <laughs> that's okay. Um, I, I'll, uh, I'll ask Councillor Bartley and Councillor Henderson to actually move the substantive recommendations in confidential, uh, but it's been moved that we, uh, that we note there is a confidential report coming. Um, I'll put that motion. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. And I declare that carried. Um, item number 12, as I said, has been deferred. Uh, I'll now put the motion that uh, we uh, defer, uh, that we uh, move to uh, confidential and exclude the public on the basis of protecting the private information about individuals who have been uh, nominated but not yet approved. Um, do I have a seconder for that? If you saw. Collins, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Yep. aye. To the contrary, aye. no. I declare that carried. And can I suggest that we have a, uh, an adjournment until 1 pm when we come back to conclude the emergency committee with discussion E1, uh, the appointment of district licensing chairs and members? Um, can we, Mr Mayor, I think there's a um, request that we have a bit longer than just 10 minutes, please. Okay.
Okay. Um, if, if people maybe want to take the opportunity to have some lunch, would uh, would 20 minutes be more appropriate? 10 past uh, 10 past one. Okay, I'll suggest that the meeting uh, resumes uh, under the um, business uh, Skype confidential um, channel uh, at uh, 10 past one. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. We'll catch up then. Cheers.